Buenos días. We're ready to begin, please. Council members, alternates. Dear friends, please take your seat. Good morning, bon dia a todos. It is uh, my great pleasure to open these, uh, the 64th Jeff Consul meeting here in Brasilia. I hope everybody had a good trip down here. I want to uh, also welcome the elected uh, chairperson, Mr. Tom Bui from Canada. Brazil has been an important and close partner of the Jeff for decades. This it was uh, founded over here, not in Brasilia, but in Rio in 1992. Over the last 30 years, uh, the Jeff has invested more than $1.2 billion in Brazil in more than 130 projects and helped generate additional $5 billion in co-finance. As we all know, Brazil is a mega biodiverse uh, country that has the largest intact forest on earth, more than 7,000 kilometers of uh, coastline, vast natural resources, and a, and a diverse, highly educated population, making it an economic and political powerhouse. Brazil has another unique ecological feature. It holds uh, unique biomes not found anywhere else. The Caatinga, the Cerrado, the Mata Atlantica, together with Pantanal and Pampas, are areas that are strategically important in the global level effort to preserve nature and combat uh, climate change. At the same time, Brazil must confront climate change, biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, and pressures on those resources, pressures on the forests, on the soils, on the lands, on the oceans, on wildlife that threaten and undermine human development, livelihoods, and social justice. We can say that Brazil's challenges are, in many ways, a microcosm of the challenges facing the planet as a whole. It is fair to say that projects across Brazil's diverse ecosystems help shape the GEF as it evolved from a small pilot program to a multilateral fund seeking to catalyze transformational changes in the behavior of people, governments, and businesses. Together with the GEF, Brazil is well placed to demonstrate the enormous potential of a transition to a nature positive economy, to tackle the drivers of environmental destruction, and to advance transformative changes across food, land use, energy, urban, and other key human systems that today, unfortunately, shape the planet. This week, the Jeff Council will decide on the approval of a record 1.4 billion work program to tackle the climate biodiversity and pollution crises, targeting the root causes of environmental damage. They include national, regional, and global initiatives, such as the Amazon, Congo, and the Critical Forest Biome Integrated Program, which spans 87% of existing tropical forests across 25 countries. I'm coming from a very interesting three-day visit to the state of Amazon, where together with many of the council members, we witness the great strides Brazil is doing to preserve and sustainably manage key biodiversity areas, where local communities and indigenous groups are key actors who are fully in power to drive action. With, with this backdrop, I'm honored by the presence of uh, ministers and vice ministers from the federal government of Brazil. Without any further ado, please allow me to give the floor to Marina da Silva 
Minister of Environment and Climate Change of the Federal Government of Brazil. Minister, you got the floor. Senhoras e senhores, bom dia a todos e a todas. Eu agradeço a oportunidade de participar da abertura da 64 quarta reunião do Conselho do GEF em Brasília. E, primeiramente, eu gostaria de cumprimentar o diretor-geral e presidente do GEF, Carlos Manuel Rodrigues, e o representante do Canadá e co-presidente do Conselho, Tom Bui, estendendo os cumprimentos a todos os conselheiros e conselheiras, agências internacionais, membros do, setor, do secretariado e equipe organizadora e observadores desse importante evento. Gostaria também de saudar a minha amiga, ministra dos Povos Indígenas, Sônia Guajajara, e em nome de quem eu cumprimento os representantes é, de governos, da sociedade civil e demais participantes desse evento. Enalteço de um modo especial o papel absolutamente central dos povos indígenas e das populações e comunidades locais, mulheres, jovens e outros atores não governamentais na luta pelo fortalecimento da democracia, proteção do meio ambiente e no enfrentamento da emergência climática. É com satisfação que participo deste, desta que é a primeira reunião do Conselho do GEF realizada fora de sua sede. Esta reunião é revestida de especial importância para o Brasil, também por outro motivo. Trata-se de uma homenagem e um tributo ao legado do biólogo e conservacionista brasileiro Gustavo Fonseca, que participou, que partiu precocemente em 2022. Nos últimos 15 anos, Gustavo teve papel fundamental para o desenho do que é hoje o GEF. Foi também responsável por notável e inspiradora contribuição ao desenvolvimento da ciência e da ação em defesa da biodiversidade global, missão que cabe a todos nós resguardar. Por sua competência, por sua dedicação e no legado que nos deixou Gustavo Fonseca, presente. Ter o Brasil como sede dessa reunião é decisão muito coerente com o que o novo governo do presidente Lula tem deixado claro perante todo o mundo. O firme compromisso de nosso país com o enfrentamento da mudança do clima, a luta contra a perda de biodiversidade e o combate à degradação do meio ambiente em todas as suas formas, cujos efeitos são negativos para todos, especialmente para as populações mais vulneráveis. Exatamente por isso é que o Brasil assumiu o compromisso ousado de colocar o clima no mais alto nível das prioridades e o compromisso de alcançar desmatamento zero na Amazônia e no Brasil até 2030. Sabemos que os impactos da mudança do clima e da perda da biodiversidade agravam a pobreza, a fome e a desigualdade, sendo necessário enfrentar esses desafios de forma transversal e integrada, como tem sido a ação do governo do presidente Lula. Para tanto, precisamos atuar em duas frentes simultâneas, promover uma reforma da arquitetura global de financiamento e democratizar os espaços de tomada de decisão sobre o futuro do planeta. É com esse espírito que o Brasil pretende sediar a COP30 da Convenção do Clima em 2025 em Belém, levando para a Amazônia o mais importante encontro internacional sobre clima. Antes disso, ainda em agosto desse ano, realizaremos também em Belém a cúpula dos países amazônicos, buscando conjuntamente as bases de um modelo de desenvolvimento para toda essa região. Vivemos um novo momento em que a agenda socioambiental e climática no governo do presidente Lula tem recuperado espaços importantes. 
em seis meses de governo, já temos resultados positivos relacionados às nossas principais metas quando assumimos, como, por exemplo, o fortalecimento das instituições governamentais na área ambiental, o combate ao desmatamento, que já temos uma, que uma queda inicial, uma atuação ativa de liderança nos fóruns globais de meio ambiente e o combate ao garimpo ilegal em terras indígenas, que com certeza a minha colega Soninha Guajajara vai tecer comentários sobre isso. Além disso, restituímos é, e revigoramos o Fundo Amazônia, obtendo apoio de antigos e de novos parceiros internacionais, retomamos a criação de áreas protegidas e estamos utilizando igualmente a estratégia e o plano de ação nacional para a biodiversidade que se encontram sob a consulta pública, com vista a acolher subsídios e sugestões de diversos setores da nossa sociedade. Reitero o firme compromisso do Brasil em atuar conjuntamente com a sociedade civil, os movimentos sociais, o setor produtivo, a comunidade científica, que nos últimos quatro anos foram alijados do debate e do processo de tomada de decisões sobre a conservação e o uso sustentável dos recursos naturais. Entre as medidas em curso, destaco a reestruturação de espaços de participação social que foram enfraquecidos ou descontinuados nos últimos quatro anos, como o Conselho Nacional do Meio Ambiente, o CONAMA, a Comissão Nacional de Biodiversidade, o CONABIL, a Comissão Nacional de Povos e Comunidades Tradicionais, entre outros colegiados fundamentais para a formulação de políticas públicas socioambientais. O país voltou a abraçar o desafio de manter sua condição de maior detentor de biodiversidade e provedor de serviços ecossistêmicos do planeta e tem buscado a provisão de recursos técnicos e financeiros para sua conservação e uso sustentável. Mas há muitos desafios pela frente a serem enfrentados na esfera pública, institucional e financeira incluindo ações afirmativas que valorizem o papel central dos povos indígenas e das comunidades tradicionais como guardiões da biodiversidade, assim como o reconhecimento da importância de seus modos de vida e saberes tradicionais associados à biodiversidade. As parcerias e os apoios serão vitais para aprimorar as políticas ambientais, implementar uma transição justa e inclusiva, com ações afirmativas para a abertura de mercados aos produtos de base sustentável, proteção da bioeconomia, é, promoção da bioeconomia e dos empregos em indústrias verdes. Essas são medidas necessárias para estabelecermos um novo ciclo de prosperidade com democracia, combate à desigualdade e sustentabilidade. Senhoras e senhores, a Convenção sobre Diversidade Biológica já mostrou o tamanho do desafio a ser enfrentado ao estabelecer a meta de mobilizar pelo menos 200 bilhões de dólares para, é, por ano até 2030, para viabilizar a implementação do marco global da biodiversidade. A necessidade de outros 100 bilhões de dólares por ano foi estabelecida em 2015, no âmbito do Acordo de Paris, para o enfrentamento da mudança do clima e adaptação em países em desenvolvimento. Diante da missão, do desafio que temos, é inegável que os fundos ambientais existentes estão muito aquém das necessidades de financiamento para a implementação dos compromissos assumidos nos fóruns multilaterais. Senhoras e senhores, nessa importante reunião do GEF, serão definidas as diretrizes do novo Fundo para a Biodiversidade. O mandato dado pela COP15 da Convenção sobre Diversidade Biológica é para o estabelecimento de um fundo para apoiar a implementação do marco global da biodiversidade 
indicando que os recursos devem ser alocados prioritariamente na conservação da biodiversidade, da diversidade biológica. Nosso desafio é o de in, in, integrar benefícios, é, integrar, entregar benefícios ambientais globais focado em projetos com o escopo e a magnitude necessários para promover a efetiva proteção desse importante patrimônio. Nesse sentido, não podemos fazer da proteção do meio ambiente e do combate à pobreza, que é altamente necessário, um dilema irreconciliável de escolha. Temos a obrigação ética, moral e política de trilhar um caminho global em que as dimensões ambiental, social, econômica e econômica estejam igualmente integradas. Uma transição ecológica justa e inclusiva passa necessariamente por um desenvolvimento duradouro, mais equilibrado e mais equânime para todos, guiado por valores humanos, sociais e ambientais. Exatamente por esse princípio é que precisamos estabelecer arranjos equilibrados, Países que detêm a maior parte da biodiversidade planetária precisam ser também protagonistas nos processos decisórios de alocação dos recursos. São eles os que mais conhecem as reais necessidades, desafios e as limitações inerentes a esses ambientes naturais, cujas consequências da degradação impactam, sobretudo, as populações mais vulneráveis. O Brasil na condição de país megadiverso, está firmemente comprometido com a internalização das metas do marco global da biodiversidade e a efetivação da visão 2050 para a biodiversidade, com vistas a promover a harmonia e a integração da vida humana com a natureza. Encerro desejando uma semana de trabalho muito produtiva a todos. Esta reunião representa uma grande oportunidade para criarmos pontes e canais de diálogo e de concertação política. Coincidimos na importância atribuída à biodiversidade como um patrimônio e um ativo valioso na superação dos desafios globais ligados ao desenvolvimento econômico e ao enfrentamento da crise climática de maneira frontal e comprometida para que o mundo possa alcançar um novo ciclo de prosperidade, em que possamos ser, ao mesmo tempo, economicamente prósperos, social, socialmente justos e ambientalmente sustentáveis. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, senhora ministra, por suas palavras, sobretudo por recordar a memória de nosso grande e querido amigo o doutor Gustavo Fonseca, do qual haremos uma remembrança ao final desta cerimônia de abertura. Obrigado, senhora ministra. Então, so, let me now ask um, Minister Sonia Guayayara, Minister of Indigenous Peoples, to address the conference. Minister, adelante. Eu digo bom dia a todas, todos e todes, né, com muita alegria que junto com a ministra Marina Silva e demais colegas do governo brasileiro, participo da abertura do 64º Encontro do Conselho do GEF e o primeiro realizado aqui no Brasil. Quero saudar aqui o nosso presidente do GEF, Carlos Manuel, e, em nome dele, cumprimento todos os demais conselheiros e conselheiras. Bom, em todo este período, o GEF contribuiu com muitos projetos essenciais para a proteção do meio ambiente. A diversidade de ministérios aqui presente é um reconhecimento da importância que o Brasil dá ao GEF. Lembro bastante do GEF indígena, que ajudou a criar uma política nacional de gestão territorial e ambiental indígena, a PENEGAT. Inicialmente, né, era um projeto piloto chamado Gestão Ambiental e Territorial, 
e, a partir do GAT, nós construímos a política nacional que está, retomada, está sendo retomada neste governo e cujo Conselho Paritário se reunirá em pouco menos de 15 dias. Também me alegro em dizer que temos um projeto já na agenda das senhoras e senhores, em parceria com o Ministério da Ciência e Tecnologia. Queremos avançar no mapeamento da biodiversidade dos territórios indígenas. Este ano de 2023 é muito importante para os povos indígenas, porque, com a posse do presidente Lula, voltamos a priorizar a agenda socioambiental. E, pela primeira vez, temos o um Ministério dos Povos Indígenas no Brasil, e protagonizado por lideranças indígenas. Isto não é pouca coisa, seja na busca da governança interna, seja na construção de melhores práticas internacionais. Hoje, o Ministério dos Povos Indígenas é composto por três secretarias que, com apoio de outros ministérios, buscam atingir a totalidade dos direitos indígenas, incluindo aí a proteção de seus territórios e da biodiversidade. Porque só conseguimos garantir a efetiva proteção com políticas públicas que começa na demarcação efetiva dos territórios indígenas. Esta é nossa primeira prioridade. Sem demarcação, não há como fazer proteção. E mesmo após a demarcação, é necessário, em muitos casos, garantir a posse do território, a partir de políticas de retirada dos invasores. E falando na retirada de invasores, é desesperador ver como quatro, seis anos de governos omissos com os direitos humanos trazem tantos prejuízos para o mundo. Estamos enfrentando uma guerra no território Yanomami. Neste final de semana, após um mês de buscas, tivemos a notícia do assassinato de Júnior Yanomami da comunidade Sikamapiú, por garimpeiros dentro do território Yanomami. Em maio, a companheira Angelita Yanomami, tradutora e agente de saúde, também foi assassinada. É triste dar estas notícias ao mundo, mas é importante evidenciar a luta que fazemos aqui. Várias ações para enfrentar a desnutrição e atacar o garimpo estão sendo realizadas. E neste mês de junho, ainda não tivemos alerta de novo garimpo no território. Semana passada, agora no Parque do Xingu, a Polícia Federal e o IBAMA desmontaram uma quadrilha que promovia desmatamento, extração ilegal de madeira e furto de bens da União, no prejuízo de quase 2 bilhões de reais. O efetivo combate ao garimpo e aos demais crimes que destrói a natureza e os territórios indígenas só será efetivo quando a proteção do território vier associado a políticas de etnodesenvolvimento das comunidades, integrando a produção indígena à cadeia da sociobioeconomia, ao reconhecimento pela proteção da biodiversidade e à promoção e preservação das línguas. Lembrando que nós estamos vivendo agora a década das línguas indígenas estabelecido pela Unesco. A promoção e proteção da cultura indígena que reconhecem a prioridade da Mãe Terra, que traz uma nova perspectiva de civilização. E tudo isto é tarefa do nosso Ministério. Como costumamos dizer com nossos parentes e parentas aqui, não somos um ministério que só olha para o passado. Pelo contrário, junto a outros órgãos, somos os ministérios do futuro. Estes ministérios do futuro estão nas palavras do presidente Lula, em vários de seus discursos. As senhoras e os senhores 
ouviram o que foi dito em Paris nesta semana. Além de reafirmar que a questão climática não é secundária e convidar todas e todos vocês para a COP30 num país amazônico, Lula também lembrou que temos outros cinco biomas muito importantes para o planeta e nos convidou a pensar uma nova governança global que melhor aborde os desafios mais centrais do mundo, como as emergências climáticas e a desigualdade social. Precisamos dar um salto de qualidade de financiamento e investimentos em políticas estruturantes que mudam a vida dos países. Neste sentido, Lula reforçou que a ausência de financiamento internacional ao desenvolvimento é uma das causas do protecionismo. A partir do momento que as políticas socioambientais são financiadas por mecanismos internacionais, nós expandimos nosso orçamento e isto possibilita alcançar a responsabilidade fiscal com a efetiva proteção socioambiental. Mas é possível ir além. O financiamento internacional permite a integração de parâmetros e metodologias, a harmonização de critérios, de alocação de recursos, metas, indicadores, e assim permite alcançar de forma coordenada as metas globais. Isto importa muito para nós. Queremos proteger nossos biomas, não só porque ajudam o Brasil, mas porque são necessários para o mundo. E quando colocamos as metas globais no centro de nossa política, ao invés de metas nacionais, resta menos espaço para políticas protecionistas. O Ministério dos Povos Indígenas quer contribuir para este debate. E estamos cada vez mais preparados para ter acesso a estes recursos e integrar nossas políticas internacionalmente. O GEF, dessa forma, está na linha de frente da proteção socioambiental, mas também da busca por um novo equilíbrio econômico com centralidade ambiental. Porém, por mais importante que sejam todas as ações, até agora, e estamos já na oitava capitalização, por melhores que sejam as iniciativas aprovadas, o mundo ainda caminha para o colapso. É urgente que consigamos atingir as metas de 2030. Assim, precisamos de novos fundos, de uma nova integração mundial, com base no financiamento ao etno desenvolvimento. Por isto, este encontro é tão importante. Vocês estão operacionalizando uma das mais importantes decisões da última COP da biodiversidade. Assim, quero contribuir com algumas mensagens. A primeira é que não vamos resolver todos os problemas do desenvolvimento com este novo fundo. É necessário estruturar outros, inclusive fundos para combater a desigualdade e a pobreza. Mas este oriundo da CDB precisa ser focado para ter uma contribuição efetiva no mundo. Ele precisa atuar para a conservação e o uso sustentável da biodiversidade em todo o mundo. Ele precisa ajudar os países a alcançar as metas da CDB. Por isto, ainda que cada pequena área de preservação seja importante, as metas pedem um fundo que precisa garantir escala e precisa olhar de forma concreta para a realidade dos países megadiversos, como aqueles que podem contribuir com a escala necessária. Estabelecer um fundo que não considere esta realidade é ir contra as prioridades que foram acordadas no marco global, no marco global de Comen e Montreal. E, principalmente, ir contra a urgência da busca por alternativas. Me remeto agora às outras deliberações da COP na sessão C da decisão 1504. Está escrito sobre as contribuições e direitos dos povos indígenas e comunidades locais. 
Lá fala que somos guardiões da biodiversidade. Devemos ser parceiros na conservação, restauração e uso sustentável. E que, portanto, devemos ser incluídos de maneira plena na participação efetiva, tomada de decisões. Entendemos que isto vale para cada projeto em particular, mas vale também para os espaços de avaliação e deliberação de projetos. Precisamos de mais representantes indígenas e de comunidades tradicionais também neste espaço. Finalmente, gostaria de falar da meta 3. Ela expressa que até 2030 precisamos que pelo menos 30% das áreas terrestres e aquáticas estejam efetivamente conservadas e ecologicamente geridas. Estamos falando aqui de demarcação de territórios indígenas, aquela que disse no início do discurso ser nossa primeira prioridade. Dados das Nações Unidas apontam que os territórios indígenas protegem 80% da biodiversidade do planeta. O jefe indígena, no passado, foi responsável por iniciar a construção da PNEGAT, a Política Nacional de Gestão Ambiental e Territorial das Terras Indígenas, que será retomada nos próximos dias. Queremos que ela esteja integrada de maneira efetiva aos parâmetros mundiais de conservação, para ajudar na proteção da biodiversidade no planeta. Estamos fazendo o nosso melhor, mas precisamos efetivamente do apoio deste novo fundo para atingir escala na gestão dos territórios e contribuir para a meta 3 da CDB. E não ficar à mercê daqueles setores ainda fortes no Brasil que tentam obstruir os direitos indígenas e a proteção ambiental. Contamos com as senhoras e senhores, boa reunião nestes dias, muito obrigada pelo convite. Nunca mais um Brasil sem nós. Muito obrigado, obrigado, senhora ministra. Now it's my pleasure um, to introduce Fernanda Machiavelli, the deputy minister of rural development and family farming. Vice Minister, you got the floor, please. Bom dia para todas, bom dia para todos. Quero, em primeiro lugar, cumprimentar o Carlos Manuel Rodrigues. Também queria cumprimentar as minhas, as, minhas ministras, né? Marina Silva, a Sona Guajajara, é, que, enfim, nossos colegas é, de governo e nossas líderes em todas as pautas que se referem à sustentabilidade. É, eu quero também cumprimentar minhas colegas aqui de mesa e cumprimentar todos os conselheiros do GEF, esse fundo que tem feito tanta diferença no mundo inteiro para que a gente possa enfrentar as mudanças climáticas, fazer as adaptações necessárias e mitigar esse processo que está em curso, que precisa ser revertido. É, eu tô muita satisfação de dizer que, em primeiro lugar, o Brasil recriou o Ministério do Desenvolvimento Agrário e da Agricultura Familiar. O presidente Lula fez isso de um marco, porque a agricultura familiar no Brasil representa 77% dos estabelecimentos rurais, é responsável por 70% dos alimentos consumidos pela nossa população e também organiza o sistema de produção dos indígenas, dos povos extrativistas, dos quilombolas, dos assentados da reforma agrária, das mulheres rurais, da juventude rural, enfim, dos agricultores e agricultoras familiares que, na nossa legislação, compõem todo esse conjunto que eu acabei de mencionar. Nós estamos na véspera do lançamento do Plano Safra da Agricultura Familiar, é, que é um conjunto de medidas que, anualmente, o, o, são lançadas para estimular determinadas práticas da agricultura. Ele é um montante bastante significativo de crédito rural e que, nesse ano, a partir de um diálogo muito próximo com a ministra Marina, nós estamos lançando uma série de medidas para incentivar determinadas práticas, práticas muito mais sustentáveis. Então, a gente vai ter uma... Eu não posso é, adiantar os lançamentos do nosso presidente, 
Lula, que será na quarta-feira, todos vocês convidados, se ainda estiverem aqui em Brasília, na quarta-feira pela manhã, mas vão ser práticas para reduzir, o, 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 reduzir os, os juros cobrados para linhas de crédito que tem, é, estimulam a agroecologia, a bioeconomia, o manejo sustentável, os produtos da sociobiodiversidade, é, a, a manutenção de florestas e a produção e a, de agroflorestas além de uma série de medidas para estimular o aumento da produção de alimentos no Brasil. O nosso desafio, quando a gente pensa é, a realidade brasileira, ele se conjuga é, no enfrentamento às mudanças climáticas e à superação da fome. E a gente só vai conseguir fazer isso é, aliando essas duas estratégias, pensando na mudança dos sistemas agroalimentares, nós precisamos de sistemas agroalimentares sustentáveis, saudáveis e, na perspectiva do Brasil, também inclusivos. É, de, por meio dessa transformação das práticas, dos incentivos, dos incentivos do governo e dos projetos que a gente vai construir, é, Estado, sociedade civil, setor privado, organismos internacionais, a partir desse, dessas alianças é que a gente vai conseguir, de fato, redirecionar os nossos sistemas produtivos, garantir o um manejo sustentável, é, transformar as paisagens agrícolas, garantir a nossa sociobiodiversidade e a diversidade dos cultivos. E para isso que a gente está aqui também sensibilizando vocês, que são os conselheiros do GEF, para a importância que esse fundo já teve para as políticas do Ministério do Desenvolvimento Agrário, para a agricultura familiar, que a gente espera que volte a ter também nesse, nova, nesse novo momento do nosso país. Infelizmente, os assentamentos da reforma agrária também foram responsáveis, que são concentrados na Amazônia, 30 por, é, 50% dos assentamentos da reforma agrária no Brasil estão no estado do Pará, que é, no, que é no, na Amazônia. É, esse, nós também tivemos, durante esse período, sem fiscalização, sem acompanhamento, sem assistência técnica e extensão rural, tivemos uma contribuição significativa para o processo de desmatamento. Isso precisa ser revertido. E vai ser revertido com crédito para sustentabilidade, com assistência técnica e extensão rural, com apoio para nós levarmos é, os viveiros, as mudas e criar novas florestas produtivas, incentivar a produção sustentável dos alimentos é, de forma equilibrada, com todo o respeito à nossa legislação ambiental, com todo o respeito ao que está colocado no Código Florestal, e, é, e, com, e implementando o CAR, que é um instrumento fundamental é, para nossa é, para garantir o, o, a produção sustentável no Brasil, e especialmente em todos os nossos biomas, mas especialmente é, na Amazônia. É, queria, então... Enfim, soli, é, então, dentro desse contexto, o apoio a práticas sustentáveis adaptadas à agricultura tropical será reforçada por meio das nossas políticas públicas e a valorização da produção orgânica e da produção agroecológica. Nessa nova versão do Ministério, a gente também está igualmente voltados para a questão da governança fundiária, que é uma grande questão no Brasil. Boa parte da Amazônia ainda é formada de terras devolutas, que não tem, portanto, responsáveis e que nosso papel também no Ministério é definir essas responsabilidades dentro de uma Câmara, no qual o Ministério do Meio Ambiente faz parte, o Ministério dos Povos Indígenas faz parte, o Ministério da Gestão faz parte, onde a gente define o que, que vai ser floresta pública, o que está para as terras indígenas, o que, que vai ser área de conservação, o que, que é área extrativista, a reserva extrativista, e o que finalmente pode ser é, conduzido para a reforma agrária ou para regularização fundiária. Esse, essa questão da governança fundiária é um dos temas mais desafiadores que tão, nós temos também no Brasil e quando a gente olha para a área da Amazônia Legal. Pensar esse processo é, vai ser fundamental. É por essas questões, então, que o governo brasileiro entende que a valorização da agricultura familiar e, a, e o incentivo à prática sustentáveis de produção é uma estratégia central para nós atingirmos os objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável bem como as metas do Acordo de Paris e do Marco Global da Biodiversidade. É a própria estrutura e o conceito da agricultura familiar, o seu modo de produção, baseado nas cadeias curtas, na diversidade dos cultivos, nas práticas sustentáveis, esse é o símbolo da indivisibilidade dos três pilares do desenvolvimento sustentável, em suas faces social, ambiental e econômica. No passado, 
o GEF foi um parceiro fundamental nos nossos projetos elaborados e implementados. E é por isso que essa agenda, é preciso que a nossa agenda da agricultura familiar, da governança fundiária e da prática da produção sustentável dos alimentos saudáveis também estejam com força no rol de projetos apoiados pelo fundo. Então, é com esse pedido é, que eu agradeço essa oportunidade é, e convido todos vocês para o nosso Plano Safra, e acredito que nós estamos, de novo, retomando o caminho correto, o caminho que vai nos conduzir para superar a fome e para garantir a mitigação dos efeitos da mudança climática, as adaptações, que a gente consiga, de fato, preservar nosso meio ambiente e a nossa sociobiodiversidade. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigado a você, senhora vice-ministra. E agora, é meu um prazer introduce um, the Vice Minister for Climate, Energy and Environmental at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador André Correa do Lago, who has been a very close friend for the Jeff when he was a young, a young ambassador or a young foreign affairs official. He participated in the Rio uh, uh, 92 summit and from them he has been a very close friend of the GF. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, bom dia a todos. Muito obrigado, Carlos Manuel. É verdade que eu tenho um carinho muito especial pelo Jeff e estou muito satisfeito de estar aqui entre vocês uh, numa cerimônia que tem, além de grande importância, diversos elementos simbólicos que eu acredito que são muito positivos. Querida ministra Marina, querida ministra Sônia, Tatiana, Renata, Fernanda, Márcia, eu gostaria também de mencionar o simbolismo de que eu sou o único homem representando o governo brasileiro nessa mesa. Queria dar as boas-vindas a Brasília. Brasília é uma cidade que simboliza um período de desenvolvimento do Brasil eh, prévio eh, às preocupações do desenvolvimento sustentável, mas que, de certa forma, essa nova capital do Brasil foi a que fez o Brasil descobrir a beleza do bioma cerrado, né, de, que o Brasil era voltado eh, para outras eh, noções, inclusive estéticas, e eu espero que todos possam aproveitar eh, bastante esse período aqui, Uh, nesta nova capital. Uh, eu acredito também que o simbolismo de ter a primeira uh, reunião do Conselho fora de Washington uh, ser no Brasil também é extremamente bem-vinda e simboliza uh, esse... simboliza não só o apoio do Brasil ao GEF, mas o apoio do GEF ao Brasil, que já foi mencionado aqui pelas ministras, uh, e que uh, é um, uma perspectiva uh, extremamente importante desse governo, que começa uh, com objetivos extremamente próximos uh, dos objetivos do GEF uh, e, uh, e deste Conselho. Eu queria comentar muito brevemente, mas que a, 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 o que está sendo visto como um retorno do Brasil a, às negociações internacionais relacionadas ao desenvolvimento sustentável, mudança do clima, biodiversidade, a, é uma realidade. É uma realidade porque eu acho que o, o Carlos Manuel foi muito feliz ao comentar nas, seus, nas suas palavras no começo, a, que o Brasil é um microcosmo dos desafios do mundo hoje. E, realmente, os senhores, estão num, os senhores e senhoras estão num país onde há, ao mesmo tempo, uh, o, o desafios terríveis de injustiças, já mencionados aqui, uh, e uh, instituições extraordinárias, pessoas extremamente preparadas uh, e, infelizmente, pessoas também muito mal intencionadas. Então, nós estamos aqui com todas as circunstâncias que nós temos que enfrentar um pouco no mundo inteiro, 
uh, e vocês contam uh, com uh, essas pessoas de boa vontade, que há muitas no Brasil, uh, e que querem realmente transformar esse Brasil numa referência mundial de sustentabilidade. Uh, o ministro das Relações Exteriores me pediu para dar um abraço muito especial a todos vocês. Hoje é a visita oficial do presidente da Argentina, como sabem, é o nosso principal parceiro, uh, e ele está acompanhando o presidente da Argentina com o presidente Lula. Mas o Itamaraty, uh, que desde o início uh, é tão relacionado ao GEF, está uh, com uma equipe uh, particularmente preparada para levar adiante todos esses planos tão positivos que foram apresentados pelos diversos ministérios uh, que já fizeram suas apresentações. Queria comentar sobre a reunião de Belém dos países amazônicos, que já foi citado pela ministra Marina Silva, e que vai ocorrer em agosto. Eu acho que isso é de, um, de uma importância imensa, que é o Brasil primeiro falar com os seus vizinhos antes de poder... Uh, uh, ir adiante com eles uh, sobre uh, os desafios uh, de grandes uh, biomas, como o bioma amazônio, amazônico e, e essa bacia que une oito países que, em agosto, estarão, prepara estarão preparados para discutir temas extremamente complicados, porque a situação uh, se tornou uh, muito desafiadora, uh, inclusive com... Uh, uh, crime organizado, uh, falta de respeito à lei, que já foi aqui mencionado. Uh, eu acredito que nós devemos uh, ver isso também como uma grande uh, oportunidade de aproximação com a sociedade civil, e o, o governo brasileiro organizou uma, um, um seminário com a presença de representantes da sociedade civil, representantes do governo, representantes de autoridades locais, representantes também do setor privado, para discutir essa Amazônia que é possível uh, e essa Amazônia que o mundo espera que uh, os países amazônicos possam uh, uh, assegurar um desenvolvimento sustentável e uma preservação de um, desse bioma que realmente é tão uh, extraordinário. Por isso, peço muita atenção de vocês a essa conferência que ocorrerá uh, em agosto uh, e que deverá ser, eu acho, um marco extremamente importante. Uh, eu queria, uma vez mais, agradecer a todos por estarem aqui no Brasil uh, e dizer uh, que o Brasil está extremamente uh, satisfeito de passar uh, para uma nova fase uh, que foi decidida pelos países membros uh, da, 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 da biodiversidade, da Convenção da Biodiversidade, uh, e que, uh, portanto, uh, vemos essa reunião como um recomeço muito importante e emocionante para todos nós. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, senhor embaixador. Now, um, allow me to introduce uh, by the Minister for International Affairs at the Ministry of Finance, Tatiana Rosito. Vice Minister, you got the floor, please. Obrigada. É, cumprimento a você, Sr. Carlos Manuel Rodrigues, CEO uh, do GEF, e também ao co-presidente do Conselho. Uma satisfação estar aqui com as ministras uh, Marina Silva, Sônia uh, Guajajara, embaixador André, as minhas colegas também de mesa, uh, Fernanda, uh, Márcia e Renata. É, e cumprimento aos senhores todos, os uh, conselheiros, membros do conselho, não é, do GEF. Uma grande satisfação recebê-los todos aqui hoje no Brasil, em Brasília. Também uh, soube que muitos dos senhores estiveram visitando o Rio Negro. E como uh, colegas uh, de creio que também muitos de Ministérios das Finanças, acho que essa é uma experiência muito interessante, né, para nos trazer mais próximos dessa da temática da sustentabilidade, do clima, da biodiversidade, da preservação, que também é tão presente né, nos nossos trabalhos uh, de financiamento no dia a dia. É, embora o ministro uh, da Fazenda, Fernando Haddad, não possa estar aqui hoje, pela mesma razão 
que o embaixador André mencionou, temos uma visita do presidente da Argentina, ele pediu que transmitisse todo o apoio é, dele a essa reunião e a essa cooperação, a participação ativa do Brasil no GEF, em conjunto aqui também com os outros ministérios, e o apoio a essa participação no GEF e em outros fundos ambientais também na nova configuração do Ministério da Fazenda e em coordenação com os ministérios aqui presentes, temos o objetivo estratégico de aprimorar a gestão nos fundos climáticos globais, buscando um financiamento mais estratégico e eficiente para as questões climáticas, a biodiversidade, a preservação do meio ambiente no nosso país e no mundo. Mais além, o Ministério da Fazenda também em coordenação com é, é, muitas áreas de governo, desenvolve um plano de uh, transição ecológica, que reconhece que essa transição no Brasil e no mundo, ela passa necessariamente pela transformação econômica e transformação dos incentivos econômicos, não é? e muito mais além uh, dos modos de produção um, e consumo. Além disso, temos a intenção de aprofundar ainda mais esse tópico durante as discussões do G20, que ocorrerão sob a presidência brasileira uh, no próximo ano. O Brasil está comprometido em desempenhar um papel de liderança na busca por soluções e ações concretas em relação uh, à questão climática e à preservação da biodiversidade, e me, me refiro muito especialmente a é, mobilização de recursos uh, públicos e privados, não é, mediante uma arquitetura financeira internacional que reflita adequadamente uh, o tamanho das nossas ambições. Nesse sentido, saúdo também os membros da sociedade civil aqui presentes, reconhecendo a importância do envolvimento deles na tomada de decisões e na implementação das políticas relacionadas ao meio ambiente. Como também é, é, essa reunião, já, como já foi mencionado pelos meus colegas de mesa, é uma decisão, é uma reunião muito densa, com destaque para temas uh, importantes, como a implementação do novo marco global da biodiversidade. Como uma nação reconhecida internacionalmente pela sua rica biodiversidade, Uh, que já foi tão exaltado aqui, o Brasil tem o compromisso de desempenhar um papel ativo nessas discussões, assumindo plenamente a responsabilidade que nos cabe na implementação dessas do, no, do marco global do, e das políticas nacionais. Temos a consciência das altas expectativas depositadas em nós e estamos preparados para encarar esse desafio, como já, tivemos, já fizemos em diversas ocasiões no passado e agora sob liderança né, reforçada. É importante ressaltar que, diferentemente da questão climática, a conservação da biodiversidade é predominantemente uma questão local, mas que também possui impactos globais. Está diretamente ligada às características geográficas específicas e às populações que habitam essas áreas muitas vezes constituídas por povos e comunidades tradicionais, como muito bem frisado aqui pela é, ministra dos povos indígenas. Por essa razão, o financiamento para a biodiversidade apresenta desafios específicos. Envolve a preservação de recursos naturais, muitas vezes difíceis de quantificar. É complexo avaliar a extensão das externalidades positivas que a conservação da biodiversidade proporciona e, consequentemente, mensurar todos os benefícios globais decorrentes da preservação local. Temos certeza de que o Brasil tem muito a contribuir para esse debate, dada a sua história na agenda da, conversão de, de, da conservação da, e da Convenção de Biodiversidade. É, por fim, gostaria de expressar nosso sincero agradecimento às agências implementadoras, que têm desempenhado um trabalho muito satisfatório na execução dos projetos no Brasil até o momento, e dizer aí do nosso compromisso de reforçar ainda mais essa cooperação. Reconhecemos o esforço e dedicação das instituições, que são parceiras fundamentais na busca por soluções efetivas e sustentáveis. Nesta reunião do Conselho, temos a oportunidade de fortalecer nossas parcerias, trocar conhecimentos, estabelecer metas concretas para avançarmos na conservação da biodiversidade e no enfrentamento dos desafios climáticos. Contamos com o apoio de todos os presentes 
para alcançarmos resultados significativos e duradouros. Obrigada a todos e desejo um, é, uma excelente reunião e excelente debate para que possamos fazer a diferença juntos. Bem-vindos a Brasília mais uma vez. Obrigado a você, vice-ministra. E now I'm honored to give the floor to the Vice Minister of Strategic uh, Policies and Programs at the Ministry of uh, Science, Technology and Innovation, Marcia Barbosa. Vice Minister, you got the floor. Okay. Uh, bom dia a todos e todas. É um grande prazer que eu estou aqui nesse evento e começo dando saudações ao Carlos Manuel Rodrigues, que tive o prazer de conhecer agora no mês de maio, quando veio para lançar a Quinta Comunicação Nacional. Saúdo igualmente a ministra Marina Silva e Sônia Guajajara, em nome delas, todos os demais integrantes do governo. É com felicidade que vejo que temos aqui não só uma maioria feminina, mas uma grande diversidade de cores e sabores que representa o meu Brasil. Quando cheguei ao ministério, eu sou uma cientista de bancada. Quando cheguei ao ministério, descobri que lá estávamos fazendo secretamente pesquisas sobre clima, biodiversidade e transformação de cidades. E quem financiava essas pesquisas que eram verdades inconvenientes? Era o Jeff. Então, começo agradecendo a vocês por estarem presentes no momento em que o Brasil esteve tão ausente. Graças ao financiamento de vocês, podemos construir City Nova, podemos analisar nossa biodiversidade e podemos construir a comunicação nacional. Alguns de vocês já visitaram Recife, no City Nova, e vão ter a oportunidade de visitar aqui em Brasília esse evento de grande transformação. Alguns vão dizer, mas são só duas cidades mas duas cidades que dão exemplos que poderemos fazer no Brasil uma palavrinha mágica que gosto de usar cotidianamente no Ministério, escala. Algumas das atividades, por exemplo, jardins filtrantes na cidade de Recife, financiados graças ao apoio do Jeff, onde temos flores que vão limpando as águas, Encantaram o nosso presidente Lula e ele agora desafia o MCTI a transformar isso em algo que tenha escala nacional. Obviamente, as flores que nascem em Recife não nascerão no meu Rio Grande do Sul, onde agora deve estar fazendo 5 graus centígrados. Portanto, teremos que transformar os jardins filtrantes em ecossistemas filtrantes. Mas sim... Somos capazes, como país, de escalonar boas ideias quando temos oportunidades de construí-las. Ao mesmo tempo, foi graças ao Jeff que pudemos fazer a comunicação nacional para a Convenção do Clima, que parece às vezes ser só um documento, mas é um documento que envolveu mais de 400 pesquisadores e pesquisadoras em todo o país, mais de 200 instituições. Um documento muito importante, porque ele não é só uma comunicação para fora do Brasil, ele é uma comunicação para dentro do Brasil. Na semana passada estive num evento de agro, onde envolviam não só os, as pessoas que plantavam, mas os bancos, os financiadores. E esses financiadores diziam, estamos financiando créditos de carbono a partir do conhecimento gerado na comunicação nacional. Estamos entrando na quinta comunicação nacional. E para nós é muito claro que temos que trazer continuamente o que melhor de ciência temos. O que é um desafio, mas é um bom desafio. Porque será a partir desses dados que vamos pautar a transição de baixo carbono na agricultura e vamos pautar uma economia mais verde. Mas temos que avançar. Agora, temos que esse olhar da biodiversidade. Um país com seis biomas, um país com uma enorme população, precisa conseguir catalogar a sua biodiversidade. 
E hoje, o Ministério de Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação já tem uma plataforma, está desenvolvendo isso. Mas não está desenvolvendo isso de cima para baixo. Está indo nas comunidades e junto com as comunidades locais, sejam elas indígenas, ribeirinhos, estamos aprendendo com essas comunidades como catalogar essa biodiversidade. Deixa eu só citar aqui um pequeno exemplo, não da Amazônia, porque já demos muito espaço para falar da Amazônia, deixa eu falar aqui de um exemplo da Bahia, onde tem um pequeno coquinho chamado licuri. Não digam que eu chamei de coquinho, porque eles odeiam quando a gente chama de coquinho. Mas esse licuri, nós fomos na comunidade, nós conseguimos entender como era a produção, foi melhorada a produção, agora já estão uh, produzindo alimentações mais tecnológicas com base no licuri, mas mais do que isso, nós aprendemos que o licuri tem uma base farmacêutica de anti-inflamatório. Associando o que a comunidade local conhece com alta tecnologia dos nossos grandes laboratórios, nós podemos transformar essa biodiversidade em biologia sintética, que na minha área do conhecimento, porque afinal eu sou cientista, é um dos maiores desafios que temos. Sim, podemos. Com os instrumentos apropriados, poderemos catalogar, compreender e ter respostas que não serão só para o Brasil, que são respostas que poderemos levar, sim, para todas as regiões do mundo, com novos ingredientes para a transformação de uma economia com base do carbono para uma economia com base biológica, trazendo a população junto, porque é inaceitável, seria inaceitável a gente usufruir desses bens que a biodiversidade brasileira traz, se deixássemos para trás a população. Encerro dizendo que somos totalmente parceiros e parceiras das decisões que emergirão aqui do GEF. E nos comprometemos a trazer escala para essas decisões, trazer para as diversas partes do mundo os resultados científicos, tecnológicos, os aprendizados que teremos nas diversas etapas da cadeia produtiva. Porque juntos e juntas podemos. Obrigada. Obrigado, Senhora Vice-Ministra. And as it was mentioned by Minister Da Silva, it is very hard for all of us to be here in Brasilia without our dear friend, colleagues, and one of the most important uh, tropical scientists, Gustavo Fonseca. In honor, in order to honor his memory, we have prepared a small video that reflects his life and his legacy, his legacy in Brazil, his legacy in a generation of uh, young scientists, and indeed his legacy in the GF. Together, we honor as well, we are being honored as well by the presence of his son and his sister who are joining us here in this room. So can we please see Gustavo's um, video? I'm very passionate about the environment. I'm an environmentalist. And I can actually be the voice and make an action. You have a legacy that you leave uh, behind you. And that's what leadership is for me. The young people, we need trainings. We need education. We need empowerment and we need uh, incubation of our innovations. When we give resources to youth, we are not spending money, we are investing. Young people have made a clear call for change, voicing the need for direct access to funding to support capacity building, networking, and field experience. The Jeff has responded to the call with the Gustavo Fonseca Youth Conservation Leadership Program designed to truly empower youth in the conservation movement. We are honored to have here with us today Gustavo Fonseca, who is the Director of Programs at Jeff. In this role, his responsibilities include overseeing the portfolio of investments in biodiversity, climate change mitigation and adaptation, 
forests, transboundary marine and freshwater conservation, chemicals and sustainable land management. That is an impressive and urgent list of items. Welcome, we're so honored. Gustavo Fonseca led a life devoted to science and policy, paving the way for young scientists and conservationists. His legacy empowers the next generation. I admire him because he was one of the few tropical scientists who understand the importance of working within the nexus of science and policy. I admire him a lot also as a person that recognizes that one of the biggest challenges that we have today is how do we narrow down the gap within the older generation, the actual generation, my generation who has today the power to decide in public and private sector with the young generation who feels uh, that our generation compromised their future. He understood very well ways by which we can narrow down that gap and accelerate the change of guard, the system change, and how we can help those young, bright conservationists and scientists to become uh, major decision makers. Gustavo Fonseca was one of the greatest scientists in Brazil dealing with ecology, during with protection of ecosystems. He was a full professor at the University of Minas Gerais, Federal University of Minas Gerais, and did fantastic work related to many, many aspects of protecting ecosystems, maintaining biodiversity, understanding the role of biodiversity of many biomes in Brazil. Gustavo was a mentor to all, including me, but especially kind and enabling to students. So the Young Leaders Program is the perfect way to develop the next generation of Gustavos to achieve a sustainable planet. This new GEF effort ensures his legacy will endure for a long time as it supports the next generation to care for the natural world. This fund will, uh, for example, it will help us to be empowered. It will help us to be uh, more informed on some of the global policies, and also will help us to unite to, to, to really uh, unite together as young people around the world. We are grateful for Jeff because this is a start of meaningful engagement that we young people have been looking for. Over the next four years, this new program will disperse ten million dollars across four main components fellowships, grants, awards, and opportunities for networking. Graduate and postgraduate fellowships enable young conservationists to dive deeper into critical environmental issues, embracing their power to respond to challenges. Small grants provide support to experience the power of nature and feel the inspiration that will sustain careers in conservation and policy making. Financial awards establish incentives to sharpen leadership skills at global and international events. Biennial environmental symposiums provide the space to bridge intergenerational exchange, revealing opportunities, resources, and potential mentorships. What's wonderful with this new fund that's being created is that we are not only honoring Gustavo's legacy, we're also carrying on his tradition of training emerging students and also in providing small grant funds to continue to stimulate the development of uh, a cadre of, of great future conservationists, not just in Brazil, but really all around the world. I am super excited for the new Jeff Youth Fund because it's a dream come true. I think every generation hopes that the next generation lives better than they do. I hope is us. Uh, hope is about us playing our role as much as we can. My advice is that you know, take this agenda, make it yours because uh, it's your agenda at the end of the day that will uh, eventually determine the future that you will live in. Uh, so as some say, the best way to predict the future is to build it and to construct it. So you need to construct that future because that's where you're going to live. Please join me in a recognition to Gustavo Fonseca.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I will suspend the consultation so I can walk uh, with my uh, dear uh, uh, government representatives and uh, we will reconvene in a few minutes. Thank you. So, uh, Tom's uh, joyous and optimistic spirit always impact us positively in any settings. So I'm delighted uh, to be working with him closely for this council and for the next one. I also want to express once more my deep appreciation to the government of Brazil for hosting this important meeting and for the presence of uh, many ministers and vice ministers who were with us a while ago. Furthermore, let me welcome Mr. David Cooper, the Acting Executive Secretary of the CBD Secretariat, whom you will be hearing from in a few minutes. This council meeting is historic for many reasons, not least because we're holding it in a Jeff recipient country. And I can think no country better than Brazil for this uh, moment. Brazil, as you all know, is a biodiversity superpower and a global environmental leader. This week, Brazil is hosting not only the Jeff Council meeting, but also the CIF Council meeting. And Brazil will assume the leadership of the G20 next year. And most likely, Brazil will host COP30, UNFCCC COP30 in the Amazon basin in 2025. It is no surprise that Brazil has been one, also one of the closest and most impactful partners for decades. The story of the transformative partnership between the Jeff and Brazil is described in a new publication that has been shared with you all. Also, Brazil is one of the largest recipient countries of Jeff resources. Over the last uh, 30 years, the Jeff has invested more than 1.2 billion US dollars, and this has generated an additional 5 billion in co-finance. The global environmental benefits from these Jeff investments are huge, such as the creation and improvement of over 22 million hectares of terrestrial protected areas, and the mitigation of nearly 200 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Some of this invested investment has led to a significant enhancement of Brazil's institutional capacities, such as the establish, establishment of uh, FUMBIO and the support of hundreds of uh, civil society organizations through the small grant program. Some, hum, some have also been global examples, like the ARPA program, which has been the most ambitious tropical forest conservation program ever attempted in the world. In fact, last, last week, several of us council members uh, did a field visit to the state of Amazon, uh, which are part, and we were able to visit some protected areas which are part of the ARPA program. Uh, it was a great pleasure to, uh, to spend uh, time with uh, many of you and to see all together the direct benefits and the direct challenges of the work that we do at the ground. Dear friends and colleagues, I don't need to remind you of the growing environmental threats with which uh, countries and communities are the dealing on a daily basis. I don't need to remind you of the rising political tensions, economic and social strains around the world putting pressure on peoples and livelihoods. It is easy to forget how much the devastating COVID-19 pandemic revealed in terms of our fragility and how much we all depend on a healthy planet. I don't need to remind you of the groundswell movement from multiple sources 
to reform our current multilateral system in order to more effectively address global challenges and deliver lasting results. But it is my duty to remind you and ourselves that despite all of these challenges, we at the Jeff Partnership have a unique opportunity. An opportunity to combat the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, an opportunity to do the trans to accelerate the transition from our dependency on fossil fuels, destructive, extractive uh, industrial activities, and monocultive practices. An opportunity to achieve balance with the cycle of life on the planet while providing energy of water to for one billion people who lack access to these basic services and opportunities. An opportunity to spark a just green transition. And an opportunity to bring about shared prosperity and sustainable development, which is our ultimate development goal. I'm optimistic that these changes can be achieved and will happen during our lifetime as a result of the work of each one of you in this council. We have a call to action and we have to hear it together so that the Jeff and the wider Jeff partnership will directly contribute to the global advancements that we need. The responsibility is ours and we must act. To that end, I firmly believe that international cooperation is the only way forward. To me, there is no other option to effectively deal with our collective global challenges. But today's multilateralism needs to extend beyond states and include a broader range of non-state actors who are largely unrecognized constituencies that give us sustainability in our aspiration of generating global environmental benefits. This is, this is not only morally right, but also the smart and most effective thing to do. The future multilateral architecture must put equity and, and social principles at its heart. And this needs to happen soon. As CEO and chairperson of the Jeff Partnership, I'm already beginning to dedicate work so that the Jeff can be a strong and direct supporter to the youth, to civil society, to women, and to subnational government and city majors. And now we'll be proposing in the next replenishment even more ideas along these lines. Now, let's get it down to our business of this week. We have an extremely diverse and important agenda ahead of us. It is often said at the start of this meeting that this is the most important council meeting. But believe me, this is the most important council meeting in recent years. Later today, the council will consider a record 1.4 billion work program, the largest work program in the Jeff history. This is set to generate another 9.1 billion in co-financing from other sources for a total package of $10.5 billion. This spans 94% of all countries eligible for Jeff support, including less developed countries and large ocean small island development states. I will continue calling them as they are, large ocean small island developing states. Much of this is said to be delivered through six of the 11 GF aid integrated programs. And this program also includes the first trench of the GF aid small grant program 2.0. Of course, we have already discussed many for the many last month with many constituencies through the different 
consultation processes, two documents on the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, on its establish establishment, and on its uh, programming uh, directions. I want to thank you all for your constructive engagement and your hard work that has allowed us to reach this advancement point, and I will count on your continued support to bring this over the finish, finishing line this week. That we are able to establish the contours of a new fund just six months after COP15 in Montreal is truly remarkable and a testament to our collective dedication and commitment. The Jeff business plan and corporate budget reflects our core business priorities to ensure full and effective delivery of the ambitious Jeff 8 programming and policy agenda. It is also designed to complement the wider work that I have been undertaking on the internal restructuring of the Jeff Secretariat. And tomorrow you will have an opportunity to hear more about uh, my restructuring plans in an informal launch that you all are, have been informed about. Some other notable agenda items, items include an analysis of the Jeff partnership, our first formal council discussion on policy coherence, an updated communication and visibility policy, a new strategy for knowledge management and learning, and the preparing and preparation for the Jeff to serve as part of the financial mechanisms of this international agreement that has committed to protect biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. In my capacity as CEO and chairperson of the Jeff, I want to congratulate all of your governments for your wisdom and the ambition in agreeing in this historic new international treaty that will help us sustainable manage the high seas. For, for us at the Jeff, this is a great opportunity to work with many um, countries do, that do have um, exclusive economic zones, but also for us at the Jeff, this is a great opportunity to engage with landlocked mm -hmm. nations, working with them, with those resources that are resources of all the nations of this planet. I will be promoting an effort to engage strategically with landlocked nations in order to put them in the front line of action and ambition with regards to BBNJ. And as usual, we will also hear important reports and updates from our colleagues at the IEO and staff. Last, but by no means least, this meeting is a, st a stepping stone to the Jeff Assembly, which brings together government, <laughs> business, and civil society representatives across the Jeff. 100, 185 uh, membership countries. It will take place in Vancouver in August, and I'm extremely grateful to Tom and to the Canadian government for their leadership and support. So as you can see from the significant items on this council agenda, the effectiveness and the impact of the Jeff is growing. We are an efficient in our programming of resources, and we are very good in leveraging additional resources. We are increasingly agile in our support. The Jeff portfolio has impact at the country level, and the Jeff is working to further facilitate access to finance. The Jeff is also advancing, and we are doing improvement uh, in ways by which we can be more agile more uh, impactful, and we need the support of the larger partnership to be able to provide those aspirational goals that we all uh, look for. We know that uh, you continue pl to place a huge uh, trust on the Jeff. We are very uh, grateful for that. And we're deeply committed to continue to be worthy of trust and to continue to deliver on it. 
With that, I thank you for your attention, and let me turn over to my co-chair, Mr. Tom Bui. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos Manuel. Uh, as this is my first time as your elected uh, co-chair, uh, thank you so much for having the confidence in me to uh, sit here uh, next to uh, my uh, uh, colleague, Carlos Manuel. I think he liked me because we have the same hairdo. And so uh, uh, we will continue uh, to, uh, uh, let us say, uh, be with you uh, over this year in order to deliver historic and meaningful work. And I just wanted to uh, use this opportunity to, uh, uh, on your behalf, uh, as well as m myself, to say a few words of thanks. Thanks to uh, Victor and uh, Laura, uh, to the government of Brazil, uh, for uh, this very historic meeting of ours. Three decades ago, we had the Rio conventions. And then uh, Brazil gave us Gustavo Fonseca and the Amazon and also uh, the, the field trip that you have been on shows how critical uh, the Brazilian government's and the people of Brazil's contributions to healthy planet, healthy people truly is. And three decades ago, Sao Paulo and pa uh, the Pantanal welcomed me and I saw firsthand as a, as a youth and that's actually why I'm uh, with you on the Jeff. And uh, I work not only for my grandchildren, but those of yours and those of people who are not here. Because it's true. Uh, we only have one life to live, and we just need to make it count so that our future generations for, uh, can benefit from our work. That is the first uh, word of thanks. The second, because he's not allowed to thank himself and his staff. So on your behalf, thank you, Carlos Manuel, and uh, all of the Jeff Secretariat, the Jeff agencies. <laughs> because uh, I think uh, their contributions uh, allowed us to have that historic Jeff 8 replenishment. At the very beginning, I was there. We were uh, uh, not as hopeful. We were thinking about four point, maybe four billion, but through our work together, collective efforts, we delivered a historic replenishment of over 5.3 billion and almost two billion for biodiversity. And in front of us this week is a lot of uh, projects that will deliver significant biodiversity benefits. Uh, and it's through this partnership, through this Jeff family, through the hard work of Carlos Manuel, the staff, and the Jeff partnership, as he call it. I, I like to call it family because, you know, partnership is a little bit too cold for me. I like hugging and saying hello to uh, everyone. So that's the second piece of thanks. Uh, could you please give a round of applause again to the hard work of these wonderful people? <laughs> and I think uh, the third, is uh, we have to thank our ministers uh, who went to Montreal and uh, they decided to do this thing called the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and it was considered historic and they made us do a lot of work. And so this week we have the privilege of loyally implementing that historic agreement and I just wanted to uh, uh, quote a few words from uh, their instructions to us that we need to set up uh, the fund to ensure adequacy, predictability, and timely flows of funds. The other thing that they uh, reminded us in terms of uh, the uh, uh, success markers is that we are to approve the decisions to set up this fund at this council and to ratify it at the assembly in Vancouver in August 2023. So I know that uh, we have already uh, done a lot of work uh, since uh, December. We've had a lot of meetings. We just need a few uh, more days, hopefully just two. And then uh, let's uh, try to land the deal as quickly as we can so that uh, we can uh, rejoice as a Jeff family. With those uh, words of thanks, uh, let's begin business.
Thank you, Tom. Now it is my great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to, as the Executive Secretary of the CBD, Mr. David Cooper, to address the Consul. Thank you very much, Carlos Manuel, and thank you, Tom. Uh, distinguished Council members and observers, I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to address this meeting of the Jeff Council on behalf of the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'd like to add my appreciation to the government of Brazil for hosting us here in Brasilia, in the heart of the Sahado, one of the most biodiverse biomes in the world, and also for their leadership on biodiversity in the global negotiations and through national implementation. And also through champion, championing gender equality, as we saw this morning, and leadership of indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, as indeed we heard in the speeches from Minister Marina Silva, Minister Sonja Guajajara, and the vice ministers. And their presence representing seven ministries underlines Brazil's commitment across government to addressing the biodiversity and climate crisis. Allow me also to pay tribute to Gustavo Fonseca for his invaluable contributions to biodiversity, science policy, conservation on the ground here in Brazil and globally. And let us build on his legacy here this week. Colleagues, as both co-chairs have, have indicated just now, we expect this 64th meeting of the Jeff Council to be a landmark event. Six months ago in Montreal, the global community adopted the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, a major achievement for multilateralism. Now we're looking to this meeting to give serious impetus to the implementation of that ambitious agreement. We're looking forward to seeing two outcomes in particular. Firstly, the approval under Jeff 8 of Jeff's largest program of work and the largest for biodiversity ever. And coming in addition to the early action grants under Jeff 7, this will help countries make a rapid start to implementation. Secondly, as Tom has just highlighted, agreement on the establishment and the programming directions of the new Global Biodiversity Framework Fund. This is an essential complement to existing support and will help to scale up financing to ensure the timely implementation of the framework. The importance of these matters cannot be overstated. As you all know, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework aims to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and to put nature on a path to recovery by 2030. This is hugely ambitious, but it's also necessary. It's necessary to maintain the web of life on planet Earth. It's an essential part of climate action, and it's a fundamental prerequisite to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We know this from the best global assessment and from all the other evidence. We have the remaining years of this decade to put biodiversity on a path to recovery, and that means action now. Countries are facing the challenges of implementation. They have to translate the plan agreed in Montreal into national targets and national biodiversity strategies and action plans. They have to integrate biodiversity across all decision making and implement the policy measures and concrete actions on the ground needed to deliver results by 2030. This must be done through a whole of government, whole of society approach with the full engagement of indigenous peoples and local communities. And to do all this, countries need a substantial increase in resources, as was clearly recognized at COP15, both in goal D and target 19 of the framework itself and in the related decisions on resource mobilization 
and on the financial mechanism. Agreement on these matters was the most difficult part of the negotiations in Montreal. The establishment of the GBF fund will be a first test of the robustness of the agreement achieved there. The new fund is to be dedicated uniquely to support the implementation of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. It will provide an opportunity to receive funding from all sources and to quickly disperse them through streamlined procedures and with enhanced access for Indigenous peoples and local communities. I'd like to express my appreciation for the prompt actions taken by the, by the Secretariat and by Council members to respond to the request from the Conference of the Parties to establish the new, GEF, uh, the new GBF GEF, uh, fund under the GEF. For our part, the CBD Secretariat, together with the GEF Secretariat, has encouraged the CBD community, including CBD focal points, to engage directly in the consultations that have been made in preparation for this council meeting. The constructive and positive spirit of the consultations, as, as Tom mentioned, has set, sets the scene for their successful finalization here and for an agreement to establish the fund to be taken here in Brasilia so that the new fund can be launched at the Jeff Assembly in Vancouver in two months from now. Colleagues, in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, we have a good agreement, a good plan that builds upon the experience of the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, as well as the earlier strategic plans of the Convention. And while the global community did not achieve the targets set out in those earlier plans, much progress has been made and many lessons have been learned. The GEF has been a constant and trusted partner over this time. Many of the advances made have been enabled by the GEF and the additional resources it has leveraged directly and indirectly. In the coming days, you will have an opportunity to chart the next chapter in this partnership, one that helps countries move from agreement to action, one that takes us all one step closer towards putting biodiversity on a path to recovery by 2030. The CBD Secretariat stands alongside the Jeff Secretariat in offering you full support in this endeavor. I wish you very productive and successful discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Cooper. And as a final item for this, our first agenda item, which is the opening ceremony, I would like to open the floor for any comments and reactions from council members. Okay. Thank you. With this, I pass it over to my co-chair, who will be chairing the, the second agenda item, adoption of the agenda. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Carlos Manuel. Uh, this is about the adoption of the agenda. Uh, you already have the provisional agenda uh, as document Jeff uh, C6301, revision three. Uh, right now, uh, I'd invite you to have any comments or uh, add any items under other business. So, uh, uh, Rajinder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, our congratulations to Jeff team and our thanks to Brazil for hosting of this event and making us all comfortable here. Uh, first, I have a general uh, observation. This is uh, that it has been observed that there is no glossary of definition for terms used in various documents. There are many terminologies and terms used in the documents which may have uh, different legal and political connotations, uh, such as uh, case in point is, uh, you know, 
document uh, on Jeff strategy knowledge management learning. I know it's coming on as agenda number seven, maybe tomorrow, but I thought it's appropriate to point it out at the beginning. There is a mention about known state actors and it's not defined what does it mean. Uh, it may have different political connotation for different members. So this may be clarified tomorrow. I may, uh, I'm just raising this point uh, to begin with. Uh, with reference to today's agenda and to uh, include additional items to be included in agenda number 19 for tomorrow. Uh, uh, Rajinder? Yes. Um, uh, could you uh, just look at the, the adoption of the agenda and if there are any issues that you'd like to add for uh, council consideration under other business? Uh, let's move on with that. Yes, that's where I'm coming to uh, additional items on other agendas. Uh, we would, uh, on behalf of our constituency, we would request uh, the chair to include proposal for adoption of policy on engagement in disputed areas for Jeff. Uh, we have been informed that there is no uh, for engagement in disputed areas in the GEF. Uh, there has been uh, prevalent policies in various MDBs and uh, other multilateral institutions. GEF is not having any policy. So in this regard, we would request a discussion on other items uh, uh, on this head. And we would also request that GEF being uh, managed as, as a trust fund by the World Bank, that GEF may adopt World Bank Operational Manual OP 7.60 uh, pertains to, uh, to the projects in disputed areas. Thank you. With this, back to you, Chair. Thanks, Rajinder. Masood. Thank you very much. Um, since uh, you were rushing, you know, to the agenda, you know, and, and uh, I was thinking that. Uh, how to elaborate on some of the issues before going into details of the agenda. Uh, you know, it took me uh, to ask the floor. I apologize for that. Um, just I want to, to seek some clarification that, that uh, on some of the issues in particular about uh, how to operationalize this new fund under the uh, framework by diversity, uh, you know, that how we can uh, to start, you know, dialogue on that and uh, when the time would be allocated for this in, in this meeting. Uh, this is one of the queries which I wish um, um, maybe David or somebody else uh, in, in the Secretariat uh, could clarify. And uh, the second one is with respect to the internet connection in the room. Uh, because, you know, we didn't uh, print many documents and we uh, relied on having good access to internet and having, uh, seeing them, these documents on the laptop we would appreciate if uh, technically something could be done so we can have good access, you know, to these documents. And uh, the last, and uh, which is not the least, is, uh, you know, uh, the participation of, you know, countries um, in the negotiations in, in the coming weeks and months in particular with respect to the GF, GF Assembly in Vancouver that uh, we wish that, um, you know, some facilities to be considered uh, so every country could participate in those dialogues and, uh, you know, uh, every delegation to be there. Um, uh, recently we were in the, uh, uh, in Paris uh, discussing some of the uh, meetings which uh, would be hosted by, uh, by Canada in, in the uh, coming year, including this uh, GF assembly, of course, uh, which uh, some of the countries, uh, they were a little concerned with respect to the uh, visa, you know, issuing timely and having good access, you know, to Canada. So we would appreciate if uh, this to be highlighted and also to be uh, looked at, uh, you know, very carefully. So every delegation could be there if at the end we want to have a strong conclusion for a participatory uh, process of everybody. Thank you. Your comments are noted and uh, we will, uh, uh, there are just a few quick points on the uh, uh, agenda. Uh, we have allotted a lot of time this afternoon and also tomorrow to discuss uh, all of the questions related to the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund. And uh, uh, I know the Governor of Brazil with the Jeff Secretariat and the facilities here, maximum possible to make sure that we have the tools that, uh, uh, to do our job. So uh, please uh, uh, coordinate uh, to see what's possible there. On the assembly, that will be part of the uh, other business. Uh, uh, we will uh, discuss some of those things uh, uh, on Thursday, I believe. So next is Ben. Ben, please. 
Um, many, many thanks, Tom. And uh, firstly, good morning to everybody. Um, Recognising Carlos Manuel's outlining the full agenda for this meeting, uh, we would like to request an item under any other business on how to take forward the two gap analysis papers presented to this council for information and other items that should have been discussed in this council on streamlining and risk appetite so we can take forward those items in an appropriately expedited manner. Many thanks. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, since there are no other flags, uh, I, did, I just wanted to note that uh, all of your comments uh, have been noted and uh, the secretary will add uh, uh, those uh, items to all other business. I assume that the council is ready to adopt the agenda. One, two, three, it's adopted. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you so much, um, Tom, and thanks, uh, council members. With, these, um, with the adoption of the uh, agenda, we will go into agenda item number four, which is a work program for the Jeff Trust Fund. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Claude Gascon from the Jeff uh, Secretariat to introduce document Jeff slash C64 slash 04 slash Rev01 work program for the Jeff Trust Fund. Claude, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everybody. It's my pleasure to present this agenda item. During this presentation, I will go over the June work program, which is the second work program in the eighth replenishment of the Jeff. As you will see, we have continued to work diligently with recipient countries and agencies during the past six months to put together a record work program that advances all of the priorities of the programming directions of GEF-8, as well as providing support to many of the goals and targets of the newly adopted Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. The recommended work program is the largest in the history of the GEF and requests $1.28 billion from the Jeff Trust Fund, plus an additional 115 million in associated agency fees for a total work program of 1.4 billion. This almost doubles the previous record that we had established in Jeff 7. This represents a full 27% of the entire Jeff 8 replenishment. This is a record amount of Jeff resources being programmed in a single work program and includes all of the projects and most of the programs that were submitted to the Jeff Secretariat that were technically cleared by work program deadlines. This also brings the Jeff 8 programming to over 28% at the 25% timeline of the eighth Jeff cycle, which is a little bit ahead of where we were in Jeff 7 at 25%. If the program is approved, 136 of the 144 countries, or 94% of Jeff recipient countries will benefit from this work program, including 93% of all LDCs and 97% of all SIDS. This work program contains 45 projects and programs, six of the 11 integrated programs, which in fact represent 10 PFD documents, and account for over 900 million of the $1.4 billion in this work program. This work program also includes four NGI projects, 27 standalone projects, and three enabling activities, including support to countries to update their NBSAPs in support of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. We're also very encouraged with the co-financing level that this work program was able to leverage. It contains an indicative 9.1 billion in co-financing, which is also a record, meaning that each dollar in this work program is matched by $7.5 in co-financing. Looking just at the investment mobilized portion of the co-financing, this represents $7.3 billion or 80%, almost 80% of the co-financing in this work program. This means that there is a 
co-financing ratio with investment mobilized of one to 6.0 for every Jeff dollar. Biodiversity is the focal area with the highest proportion of resources being programmed in this work program. It contributes almost 50% of the total programmed resources in the work program. This is followed by climate change and land degradation with 16 and 12% respectively. International waters follows with 11% and chemicals and waste closes the focal areas with 6%. We have FGP first phase and four projects of NGI which each represent five and 4% of the total work program resources. The regional distribution, as I've mentioned, will touch 94% of all Jeff recipient countries, which is remarkable, including, as I mentioned, 43 LDCs and 37 SIDS. Latin America is the region that has programmed the largest level of resources, followed by Africa, SIDS, Asia, and Eastern and Central Asia. Much of the resources that are coined here under global our research included in the integrated programs global coordination platforms that will also benefit recipient countries participating in the IPs with technical assistance among others. 13 of the 18 agencies are represented in the June 2023 work program. UNDP, UNEP and FAO have the highest amounts programmed which account for 33, 22 and 13 percent of the total resources. The World Bank follows with 8.4% of the resources. And finally, CI and IUCN have done very well. They have already surpassed in dollar levels what they had uh, programmed in, in Jeff 7 with 91 and 86% or 6.5 and 6.3% of the work program. It's important to know. This one works. I think it's your line. Hello? You can hear me? All right. I can walk around as I give the presentation. As I was mentioning, it's important to note that the UNDP share in this work program includes a full 10% of its share of 32% that is dedicated to the SGP phase one program. The four NGI projects recommended in the work program address multiple focal areas, including climate change mitigation, land restoration, and chemicals and waste. Two of the projects focus on climate change technology, one in Chile and one in India. Two of the projects focus on sustainable agri-systems, one in the Asia region and one in the LAC region. All four projects in this work program are from MDBs and offer significant co-financing. Taken together, the four projects request 47.3 million in Jeff funding, which represents about 26% of the Jeff 8 NGI allocation. This investment has enabled the mobilization of over $1.8 billion in loans and investments, which is a co-financing ratio of just shy of 40 to one. Notably, at least 910 
$1.5 million in private sector investment is, invest is expected, which is about half of the total co-financing. This work program positions the Jeff on a strong track towards meeting the Jeff 8 targets, which were agreed on during the replenishments. Progref progress for seven out of the 10 core indicators is higher than 30%. This progress is largely attributed to the contribution of integrated programs and high impact standalone projects. As an example, pro progress agreeing to the target of creating or sustainably managing protected areas, marine protected areas, took place with the contribution of the regional project aiming to secure the resilience in the eastern tropical Pacific seascape, which covers 62 million hectares of marine protected areas. Three core indicators assessing progress in protecting areas, restoring land, and mitigating climate change have reached above 60% of their targets. This includes progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, placing land and ecosystems under and protecting marine areas. Meanwhile, the number of hectares of terrestrial protected areas that are conserved or sustainably managed has nearly reached half of its target. Because the uh, work program and the integrated programs are such an important part, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes specifically on the integrated programs. As I mentioned, these account for 900 million of the 1.4 billion in the work program. As you will recall, the process for rolling out the IP started a year ago with a detailed guidance note, was it when the detailed guidance note was issued to countries and agencies. Since then, the Jeff Secretariat embarked on a deliberate and systematic effort to ensure all countries had all the information necessary to help them assess their priorities and prepare accordingly. Between October and January, October of 2022 and January of 2023, 10 regional workshops were organized with opportunities for all Jeff participants to participate. In total, more than 1,100 people participated from 119 Jeff eligible countries. Following council endorsement of lead agency selection, the Jeff Secretariat notified countries and agencies on December 5th of 2022 of the final timeline and process for rolling out the IPs. The notice also outlined the steps for programming the IPs from submission of expressions of interest by countries to the preparations that led to their submission in the 2023 work program. The Jeff Secretariat has prepared and submitted an information document that describes how the country selection process unfolded, including trends in the interest expressed by countries, the review and assessment of expressions of interest, and the final list of selected countries to be included in the IPs in this work program. On January 16th of 2023, the Jeff Secretariat launched the call for proposals for expressions of interest for 10 of the 11 IPs, which had a lead agency selected. The deadline for submission was 17th of February, and countries were therefore given a full month to decide and submit expressions of interest for one or more IP. In total, we received 210 expressions of interest from 99 of the 144 eligible recipient countries. As shown is that in this map, expressions of interest were submitted from countries from across all Jeff regions, Latin America and Caribbean having the highest participation rate, whereas uh, followed by Africa and Asia, SIDS at 62% and ECA at 38%. The table of, uh, above summarizes the results of the expressions of interest review process. 148 of the 210 expressions of interest, or 71%, were recommended as technically sound and suitable for inclusion in an IP. The 148 successful expressions of interest were from 84 countries, with at least 41 of the countries having two or more expressions of interest selected. The table below summarizes the acceptance rates of expressions of interest submitted across the Jeff regions. Acceptance rate was high for all regions, including SIDS and LDCs. In fact, SIDS had the highest proportion of expressions of interest selected at 78%. ECA had fewer accepted expressions of interest uh, as, a, um, as part of the process. 
Based on resource availability in the trust fund, the Jeff Secretariat decided on a subset of the IPs to be included in this work program for consideration by council. In addition to resource considerations, the IPs were prioritized based on the need to present a compelling work program that demonstrates appropriate balance in programming across the Jeff Focal areas and representation across regions and between agencies. <coughs> the six IPs included in this work program, as I said, are represented by 10 programmatic framework documents with broad coverage of global environmental challenges being addressed and representing a timely opportunity to align Jeff 8 programming with global aspirations for transformative change in key systems, while at the same time responding to demands from the multilateral environmental agreements and COPs. PFDs for three IPs, the food system, sustainable cities, and wildlife conservation for development are ready and they will be submitted in the December work program. Countries already selected to participate in those IPs are already set, no further documentation is needed. In the next slides, I will present just a brief summary of the six IPs that are in this work program. The Amazon, Congo, and Critical Forest Biomes IP addresses the growing urgency to safeguard intact forest landscapes that are irreplaceable in terms of biodiversity. They soak up a third of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and are critical for other ecosystem services, as well, of course, as being important for indigenous peoples and local communities' well-being. This IP is being delivered through five separate PFDs covering the geographies identified in the Jeff 8 programming directions, or the Amazon, the Congo Basin, Mesoamerica, the Indo-Malay region, and the Guinean forest of West Africa. The five PFDs account for a total of 248 million in Jeff grants involving 25 countries that cover an estimated 87% of the existing tropical forest biomes left in the world. Eight of the countries are LDCs and three are SIDS. There is still potential for additional countries in some of these biomes to participate in this IP and we will see uh, and make decisions in the fall of how to open up a uh, second round for certain IPs. The Blue and Green Island IP focuses on addressing the interdependence of environment and eco econ economic systems in small island developing states and the need to embed nature at the center of development while maintaining the health and integrity of the ecosystems on which they rely. Through the Blue and Green Islands IP, SIDS will have the opportunity to collectively build on existing interventions to demonstrate the transformative potential of incorporating the value of nature into decision making and using innovative nature-based solutions to achieve environment and development commitments and address challenges such as food security, water security, climate change adaptation, and where possible, the elimination of hazardous chemicals. The objective is to facil facilitate nature positive development and reduce ecosystem de degradation in SIDS by valuing nature and ap applying nature-based solutions with specific application to the food, tourism, and urban sectors in these countries. The program as presented includes a cohort of 15 countries from all three SIDS subregions, Caribbean, Asia Pacific, and Africa, and were selected based on their demonstration of so strong alignment with the program vision and their potential to generate global environmental benefits through investments in promoting transformational change. The Ecosystem Restoration Program seeks to arrest further degradation and to restore and heal ecosystems and landscapes by removing identified barriers and catalyzing innovati innovative transformation. The IP will harness the growing momentum to return hundreds of millions of hectares of degraded landscapes to functioning ecosystems and the opportunity to drive synergistic benefits across multiple environmental dimensions while generating economic, ecological, and livelihood benefits. The IP will engage a cohort of 20 countries, including 13 SIDS, I'm sorry, 13 LDCs and two SIDS, with a total Jeff grant of 200 million and an additional 1.6 billion in co-financing. The National Child Projects will work in critical landscapes on restoration challenges, and most importantly, identifying, testing, and verifying the efficacy of best practices and lessons learned in ecosystem restoration for wider replication to other areas. A dedicated global coordination child project will provide a strategic hub 
to advance the programmatic objectives and to support a coherent and innovative process of program coordination and inclusive governance. The Net Zero Nature Positive Accelerator, IP, is designed to address two closely related global issues. First, the significant ambition gap that still exists between the pace of current global efforts to halt and reverse climate change and ecosystem loss with the level of action and investment required during this decade. And second, despite being inextricably linked, global warming and biodiversity loss have been generally viewed as independent challenges. This IP offers an innovative approach of combining the two global agendas to achieve impact at scale and greater coherence on both of these challenges. A key focus is to promote a whole of society approach, which links climate and nature in the context of the long-term economic planning and development and builds database consensus promoting active engagement of a broad range of public and private stakeholders. The IP will engage a cohort of 20 countries, including one LDC and two SIDS, with a total grant of over 107 million, plus almost 700 million in co-financing. The cohort includes a diverse representation between regional zones, country size, emissions, and ecosystem degradation profiles and economic conditions, which gives the program a unique opportunity to produce lessons across different regional and economic conditions. The Circular Solutions to Plastic Pollution IP harnesses the urgent and unprecedented momentum from public and political interest to tackle the root cause of plastic pollution, the ever-growing unsustainable consumption and production of single-use plastics. This IP will advance both upstream and midstream solutions in the food and beverage sector, including the elimination of single-use plastics, improving the circular design of products, as well as ensuring materials and products are circulated in practice through reuse, reuse and refill systems. The IP will engage a cohort of 15 countries, including four LDCs and two SIDS, with a total GEF grant of over 107 million and an additional 700 million in co-financing. The countries have high political and private sector commitments, interest in system change and innovation, which is aligned with the IP's theory of change and also offer great potential for generating significant and multiple global environmental benefits. The cohort of countries provides both geographical and socioeconomic representation across all continents. As each country has tailored plans to its unique context, including its key private sector actors, government agencies, and select speci selected specific strategies, the IP will result in a wealth of insights that will be synthesized and shared to inform the suite of IP countries and other plastic reducing initiatives worldwide. The IP on eliminating hazardous chemicals from supply chains focuses on two industries with long and complex supply chains that continue to drive the triple planetary crisis of climate change, chemical pollution, and biodiversity loss. These supply chains are in the fashion and construction sectors. With action in both industries, typically concentrated on climate change and biodiversity, leaving pollution behind, the IP will advance the integrated approach to reorient action in each global value chain and maximize potential for transformative change. This holistic and integrated supply chain approach is designed to be disruptive, and the program will crowd in financing to innovative companies in the supply chains. In particular, the program will foster support to businesses that design, source, and manufacture products containing sustainable materials rather than traditional non-renewable ones. The IP engages a cohort of eight countries, including one LDC and one SIDS, with a GEF grant of 49 million and 300, close to 300 million in co-financing. The eight countries will benefit from increased access to information, knowledge, and best practices from all actors while a strong South-South and South-North cooperation will ensure global coordination in finance and innovation and assure coherence across the different country investments. The integrated programs in this work program are expected to contribute significant global environmental benefits covering all of Jeff 8 core indicator targets. Relative to the overall work program, IPs deliver a disproportionate con con contribution to many of the core indicators. For example, the Amazon Congo and Critical Forest Biomes IP will contribute to protecting 
and sustainably managing almost 45 million hectares of terrestrial protected areas. In addition, close to 500 mi million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions will be mitigated through this IP. Similarly, the net zero nature positive accelerator IP will contribute to mitigate an estimated 75 million metric tons of GHGs. Some IPs such as the Amazon, Congo, and critical forest biome and the blue and green island IP will contribute significantly to multiple core indicator targets. This overall trend reinforces the importance of IPs for generating multiple environmental benefits that map to the Jeff Fogle areas. Overall, the IPs will benefit an estimated 3.5 million people divided equally among men and women. The new Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework adopted at COP15 contains four, target, four goals and 23 targets. We have done an analysis of this work program and its contribution to advancing the goals and the targets of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. First, not only is the biodiversity focal area contributing the most resources to the work program, we can report that over 81% of this work program's investment is classified as BD relevant according to our use of the Rio markers for, bi for biodiversity, obviously. The standalone biodiversity projects in this work program contribute to the implementation of 15 of the 23 targets in the new framework. Additionally, the integrated programs on the right contribute directly to most of the targets as shown in the table. Some of the targets are not advanced in this work program, but will be when we present the future IPs to the December work pr program. This is a case for example uh, of the Wildlife Conservation for Development IP that will contribute directly to achieving target number four. Finally, we have included in this work program a proposed decision on the lead agency selection for the last of the IPs, the Clean and Healthy Ocean IP. Because there had been no interest in the first round of selection, we issued a new call in April with a deadline in May for agencies to submit. The information briefing with agencies was held uh, at the uh, midpoint and basically the same protocol in terms of assessing the proposals and making recommendations to our CEO were followed identical to the first selection which led to 10 IPs being selected. A report of the proposal assessment and selection process is presented in an annex to the work program cover note. As I said, it was based entirely on the same format used for the other 10 IPs. Specifically the, for the Clean and Healthy Oceans IP, the selection process considered the following critical needs for lead agencies. First, they had to show evidence of thought leadership towards advancing the nutrient pollution agenda at the global and regional scales, which were obviously central to this IP. They also had to show a solid track record in supporting countries at global and regional levels with analysis for preparation and implementation of nutrient pollution strategies, among many other uh, aspects. And finally, they had to demonstrate understanding of cost-benefit analyses and how coordinated action on nutrient pollution may offer multiple benefits for the environment, for health, and for economic development. The JEFSEC and STAP reached consensus on a recommendation that was presented to the JEFSEC leadership and the CEO. This recommendation was accepted and the cover note draft decision includes text that asks council to endorse FAO in a co-lead arrangement with ADB, CAF and EBRD as the lead agencies for the Clean and Healthy Oceans IP. With council endorsement of the selected lead agency, the Jeff Secretary would then proceed with the next steps of programming for this IP, which hopefully would be presented at the December work, uh, council meeting. With this, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to answering any questions. Over to you, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you so much, Carlos Bernal and Claude. So I'm taking over uh, this item because uh, we want to give the, the CEO the opportunities to add his perspectives uh, to uh, 
uh, your words of uh, appreciation, I'm sure, for this uh, historic and meaningful work program, as well as initial set of questions and comments. Uh, you will note that the in the decisions and uh, decision text, you will have also until July 27th, uh, should you have additional questions and comments. So this is not the only time that uh, you have the opportunity. So the floor is open for questions and comments. Please raise the flag. Masood first. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I wish to uh, extend our appreciation to the Secretariat for this uh, descriptive and uh, brilliant you know, report and analysis uh, of the projects and also uh, the financing which is supposed to uh, take place uh, through the contribution and support of the GF Secretariat. Uh, really, this is a record and uh, we appreciate for what has been done by all of you and also uh, the Secretariat, also the UN agencies, have uh, for um, adoption and execution of these projects. But uh, to me, as a member uh, of this uh, GF Council, and there are a, a number of questions, uh, because uh, looking at this uh, report, first of all, uh, we would like that uh, such, uh, such report, if it could be available, at least uh, some weeks or days uh, earlier than the GF Council, so we have enough time to go through the details because uh, many elements you know, were raised and were uh, uh, referred to by our dear colleagues from the Secretariat, but capturing all of the elements you know, would be a little difficult at these short uh, moments. Um, the second is that about uh, the distribution of projects, uh, because uh, looking at the numbers uh, allocate being allocated to uh, different regions and sub-regions, shows um, a great, a big, you know, the disparity among the numbers of projects as well as, you know, uh, the uh, amount of uh, allocations. So uh, this is something which needs uh, to be looked at, uh, I think, uh, very carefully uh, because uh, some of the areas are, you know, something new, maybe some uh, regions or sub-regions. Uh, still, they do not have the capacity, you know, to uh, define and design, you know, the new projects based on the criteria which uh, has been uh, considered and introduced by uh, under various uh, multilateral environment uh, agreements. Uh, so capacity building for those uh, countries and region is something that uh, implementing agencies as well as the secretariat you know, could look at them. Uh, and also uh, we wish to know that uh, if uh, some of the criteria which uh, previously in, pre I mean in previous council meetings has been designed, how much those criteria have been affecting the ability of member countries to, uh, to design and introduce a new project uh, to the uh, Secretariat. And if there has been any other uh, elements or factors which have been hampering um, the wish of the uh, countries uh, to introduce such projects, um, because uh, we think that this, this uh, distribution of project is a little source of concern and we would appreciate if uh, this to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Masood. Uh, Rajinder? Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, our compliments for the Jeff team for such a impressive uh, presentation and a detailed and comprehensive uh, document. Um, we have uh, brief observations uh, as uh, echoed by my colleague uh, from Iran also. Uh, the first is the integrated program in this work program have only 14% allocation uh, to entire Asia region. With such a diverse environment, biodiversity and land area, we feel uh, that this may be relooked into. This also uh, is considerably lower than star allocation to Asia. Uh, we would like to, uh, you know, management to clarify how does the share of IP going to different, uh, to be different from star allocations, which is based on a formula for allocation of the funds to countries, um, which we feel uh, is different. And uh, is there a large mismatch between star allocation and IP allocation? If so, 
um, why and what is that, the quantum of that. Case in point is IP allocation uh, vis a vis. Uh, we are happy to note a, a good 432 billion uh, million alloc allocation for. Um, uh, you know, for the LSE reason, but this compared with Asia, which is just 14%, uh, is a point to be noted. We would like, uh, in fact, IEO to evaluate the pattern, whether it's one-off case or it has been a pattern in previous allocation also. With this, thank you, and back to you, Chair. Thank you, Rajinder. So we have uh, there is the next three. Uh, there is one more point, uh, you know, um, our council member from Nepal also wants to raise under this agenda. I'll give the floor to him, if you permit me. Uh, thank you, Chair. Let me begin my thanking the government of Brazil for hosting this council meeting in this beautiful capital city and the secretary for excellent arrangement of the meeting. We broadly support the management proposal of proposed or program, including programming trends in the ZEP resources relating to focal area, the strategy and objectives, and with proposed distribution by region in the ZEP agencies. We note that it comprises coverage 45 projects and programs, I want to draw attention on the climate vulnerabilities of the countries of our constituency. We are in favor of equitable allocation of the resources in the region. We understand that projects continue to be consistent with the instrument and their policy and procedures. We have a strong opinion that we should learn from the past experiences. We know what works and what does not. We are in a few that core project cost has to be mobilized for government system to ensure better control ownership, promoting coordination among agencies for delivering sustainable solution. I think detailed discussion on it could be done in up upcoming assembly. We are happy to see the recommended work program in the la largest industry of the ZEP. We are in favor of diverging climate financing here we see in the same speed, each dollar provided by the ZEP will be matched by dollar 7.5 in co-financing from other sources. It urges ZEP to foster a strong and trusted partnership with donors, MDBS, private sectors, and other climate funds and facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. So uh, next up is Annette, and uh, followed by Stephanie and Gabriella. And after five speakers, we'll turn it over to Claude so that uh, you know he has time to respond properly to all of your comments and questions. So Annette. So that's Annette from Germany. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. And congratulations to the Jeff Secretariat for this um, truly historical work program and the um, presentation, which was extremely interesting. We overall we very much welcome the, the, the work program. Um, we think they are generally very well um, aligned with national circumstances and focal area objectives. Uh, further, we welcome the strong focus on SEEDs and um, LDCs. Um, the aspect of co-financing and private mobilization ratios are um, very satisfactory. Thank you for the explanation and taking that up. Um, we'd also like to know a little bit more about when it's broken down, how much private sector mobilization was actually there. Um, the, the term, in, uh, term of um, investment mobilized wasn't quite clear to me. Um, and Germany also noticed with a little bit of concern <laughs> um, that UNDP is proposed to receive 33.4% um, uh, of the total resources of the work program, which clearly contradicts the agreed cap of 30% per agency under GEF 8. In addition, UNDP is proposed to receive 65% of the LDCF 
uh, and uh, resources approved during this LDCF and SCCF board meeting as well. We request the Chief Secretariat to take effective measures to ensure a better distribution of projects among agencies. We further request the Secretariat to develop a Chief Aid midterm evaluation focused, amongst other things, on the deconcentration of resources amongst agencies. In particular, we would like to encourage the Chief Secretariat to strengthen the engagement of um, IFIs. Uh, in the implementation of Jeff 8. Only 11.7% of the resources of this work program are allocated to the eight MDB and IFI Jeff agencies. When only considering the regional development banks, this figure amounts only to 3.3%, which is far of the agreed upon aspirational target of allocation of 10% of Jeff 8 resources to regional development banks. Um, we know that there are apparently certain obstacles in the process of uh, preparing a pipeline for the work program. So addressing these bottlenecks of um, uh, communication or whatever it is locally, uh, we think is um, foremost important. And uh, so we ask to reconsider the planning process in order to include IFIs more when it comes to on the ground negotiations. Um, on the very specific um, proposal, Germany has technical concerns about the CHEF project mainstreaming climate resilient blue economy in the Benguela current large marine ecosystem region. Um, for us, it's a little bit disturbing that considering past corruption scandals in the Nib Namibian fishery sector, Germany advises to undertake a screening of past three project phases to assess the nature of the relation of the project with the actors of the corruption scandal. Germany further requests the project to consider additional measures promoting anti-corruption and good governance in the sector. It is important to strengthen policy, strategy and regulatory framework to avoid loopholes between the three countries. Monitoring, surveillance and control of pollution as well as overfishing and illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing practices could potentially be addressed through joint approaches. Um, we have a couple more points on this project, which we'll send in, in writing. Um, but finally, I'd also like to um, commend the um, Chief Secretariat on um, the, the points about um, gender inclusion, um, which was very much mainstreamed throughout all the projects we saw. And uh, we very much welcome that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. So, and next, the mic will travel, courtesy of the secretary, to Stephanie Thank you. from France. La France, s'il vous plaît. Is that working? Yes. Oh. We are on the good line. Uh, bonjour à tous. Je vais m'exprimer en français. La France remercie le secrétariat, les points focaux les implementing agencies, les executing agencies pour ce work program particulièrement ambitieux d'un point de vue programmatique, thématique et géographique. Donc sur le principe, nous approuvons ce work program. Nous saluons d'ailleurs la part allouée à la biodiversité et le lien fait Ah So the translator are not hearing me. Oh, no for Spanish. <laughs> Is it working now in Spanish? Okay, so, sorry, I will start again. So, <laughs> bonjour à tous. Um, uh, donc, nous remercions uh, le secrétariat, les points focaux, les implementing agencies et les executing agencies pour ce work program particulièrement ambitieux d'un point de vue programmatique, thématique et géographique, et nous approuvons ce work program. Nous saluons la part allouée à la biodiversité et le lien fait avec les objectifs et les cibles de l'accord de Kunming Montréal. Merci au secrétariat pour ce, ce point dans, le, dans la note. Nous notons cependant qu'une faible part des financements est allouée à l'air focal sur les polluants et déchets. 
Donc l'équilibre final entre les différentes aires focales se construit bien sûr dans la durée, mais nous souhaitons rappeler que les prochains work programmes devront rattraper le retard sur cette thématique et qu'in fine, nous ne pourrons pas accepter que les équilibres prévus entre les aires focales ne soient pas respectés à la fin de FEM8. Nous apprécions la diversité des implementing agencies mobilisées pour ce work program. Nous saluons d'ailleurs la présence et le retour de Funbio, mais nous regrettons qu'aucune institution africaine ne soit mobilisée. Et comme l'Allemagne, la, comme nous regrettons que le PNUD reste prédominant et supérieur à 30% en comptant le SGP. Nous soutenons d'ailleurs le point soulevé par l'Allemagne sur la mid-term review. Nous soutenons les IP en termes d'approche programmatique multisectorielle permettant de réels efforts convergents entre plusieurs aires focales. Toutefois, plusieurs pays sont présents dans trois ou quatre IP au moins et n'aurait-il pas été utile au vu de, du nombre de propositions que vous avez reçues, n'aurait-il pas été utile pour diversifier encore davantage les pays participants de limiter le nombre d'IP par pays Par ailleurs, je suis obligée de rappeler comme régulièrement la difficulté que nous avons à voir des pays qui ne sont plus des pays en développement au sens de l'OCDE et de la liste du CAD, à être bénéficiaire des financements du FEM, alors que la France y contribue au titre de son aide publique au développement. Et nous souhaitons que les pays les plus vulnérables bénéficient au mieux de ces ressources. Enfin, nous sommes favorables au choix de la FAO, de la Banque asiatique, de la CAF et de la BIRD pour le COLID de l'IP Clean and Healthy Ocean, et c'est une satisfaction de voir les banques multilatérales de développement très associées à ce, cet IP. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Stéphanie, pour vos commentaires. Uh, Gabriella, you are next from Switzerland. Swiss constituency. technical development anyway. <laughs> Good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, and uh, since it's the first time we're taking the floor, a great appreciation to the Brazilian government uh, for hosting us. And uh, congratulations to the Jeff Secretariat, the implementing agencies, and most of all, uh, our partner countries for putting together this very impressive work program. So thanks very much for that. Um, joining others that in general were very pleased uh, with the work program. Uh, we have a few points, uh, specific questions. Uh, one related to agency concentration, uh, similar to others, we're a bit concerned about the high share of um, UNDP in the work program. Now, oh, there you go. Um, and we would be uh, interested to understand is the share of UNDP in projects with LDCs and SIDS, since we know that that may be one of the reasons. Um, They're very strong in these areas, so that would be interesting to know. We share the concern of those with a lower share of IFIs uh, in the portfolio. Um, and interesting idea from Germany on this midterm evaluation. It would be interested to understand who should conduct this uh, IEO or the Jeff Secretariat, and how would this interact with OPS 8, or how would OPS 8 build on that? We'd be interested. Maybe we can also talk about that in the IEO work program session. Uh, on the portfolio, um, could you specify what the share of LDCs is in terms of US dollars amount in the total uh, work program approved? And uh, also for SIDS in terms of US dollar amount. Um, regarding the core indicators, uh, according to the document, almost 30% of the targeted outcomes will be reached with the approval of this work program, um, largely due to the high impact uh, except expected for the integrated, progr um, integrated programs. However, for the estimation of the targets for the core indicators, a high level methodology and calculator was applied to estimate these contributions. Now we would want to understand, in the past experience has shown that the results have tended to be underestimated. Is this also the case here? <laughs> Or do we expect um, that for IP child projects, it's rather the inverse? So we, bet we want to understand how exactly you calculate those impacts and what you're assuming how they may evolve uh, when you go into more detailed methodology for calculating those. 
On the IPs, um, how did you ensure that the most impactful child projects were identified for the IPs, which were oversubscribed? And how are you ensuring that all countries, even if their projects were not selected for the IP, uh, can still join and equally benefit, in particular from the knowledge sharing uh, and learning of the global platforms for each IP if they submit an associated freestanding project? This is particularly important for my constituency because we have had cases uh, like that. Um, and that links me to the question of whether you could explain the low acceptance rate for the ECHA region. All the other countries in my constituency come from that region. Is it linked to the selection criteria or the quality of the projects being less convincing? Um, so to understand if there's a, some systemic underlying reason for that or an actual quality issue. Um, and then lastly, uh, we would like to encourage you that really the m and &E of all child projects are conducted in a harmonized manner and that we use this opportunity to generate the data so that we can really measure whether and how this new way of programming is add adding to the global environmental benefits and uh, uh, keep the GEF uh, a learning institution moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. So after five interventions, Claude, it is over. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Uh, let me start with uh, <coughs> some of the uh, um, first set of comments. Um, to our uh, uh, friend from Iran, the uh, documents are available one month in advance, uh, as all documents are for Council. Um, this cover note, which included all the information I presented, and in fact much more, were, uh, were posted um, in, uh, in early June. Um, we, uh, and, and this will be relevant for some of the other issues that uh, other council members have uh, have raised, but just as a reminder, we um, at the Secretariat are dependent on uh, country decisions uh, that have to do with the use of their star allocations, um, both in terms of where uh, and what kinds of projects, as well as in terms of the selection of their agency for any and all projects that they want to submit to the Jeff Secretariat. Um, so, although we think we have a very, um, uh, it, you know, uh, impressive coverage of 94% of Jeff eligible countries in this work program, we are still dependent on uh, countries submitting projects so that we can evaluate them, work with them, and eventually get them uh, get them cleared. Um, we have been, as you know, we have uh, uh, the council has approved the country engagement strategy in last December which in fact uh, allows the Jeff Secretariat uh, to use resources to continue and um, in, I guess uh, uh, enhance the engagement that we already had with countries through our regional teams. Um, we still uh, require perhaps more bandwidth in this respect, but we have been uh, very proactive and the um, indication that perhaps best indication of this is that and, and Carlos can vouch for this, he was uh, at some of these workshops, from uh, September to December, in fact, to January of, the, of this year, we held 10 regional workshops where basically the entire contingent, contingent of Jeff technical staff and, and uh, others were going to regions, bringing countries together and agencies together and spending three or four days building a, a good understanding of not only the Jeff 8 strategy itself, but focusing mainly on IPs, <coughs> and making sure that countries had all of the information that they needed to then be able to make the most informed uh, and impactful decisions on the use of their resources. That resulted in the what we think was an impressive interest in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in participating IPs. As I said, we had 210 uh, expressions of interest from almost 100 countries. So again, uh, we're talking about pretty impressive numbers. Um, we were able to include all of the uh, expressions of interest that were submitted uh, into the IPs, all, all of those that were deemed uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, technical soundness. And I won't speak for STEP, but they did participate in the uh, assessment and selection process. Uh, and uh, I'm confident that they uh, also felt that the process was very, very good and resulted in, uh, in, in those uh, expressions of interest that did pass to be very solid. Um, so again, that's something that 
is, is of course relevant to ensuring that, that that all of you understand that what we present is in fact a reflection of what your constituent countries submit to the Jeff Secretariat. We do have ways to encourage countries and to build capacity and to make sure that they can access the resources, but we can't write a PIF and we can't work, uh, take the role of the Jeff agencies, and so that is something that's, uh, that, that sometimes um, skews a little bit of, the, uh, of the, the distribution of resources and so forth. Um, in terms of India, uh, the Asia uh, representation in all of the IPs, in fact, uh, is not 14 percent, it's, it's uh, 22 percent. So Asia is getting a full 22 percent of all of the uh, resources that are going to IPs in this work program, or uh, 276 million. If you compare that uh, to five other regions, it's, uh, it, it's not a bad uh, about outcome. Um, in terms of some of the comments of uh, the relationship between STAR and IP uh, and uh, the allocation, equitable allocation of STAR, I think these are uh, questions that are perhaps best taken offline. Um, as many of you know, the STAR uh, allocation and the STAR policy is something that's discussed and approved during the replenishment negotiations. These are, um, these are uh, uh, open uh, and public uh, uh, topics. Uh, we uh, then publish the STAR allocations the first day of a cycle, and so July 1st of 2023, we published and po posted a paper that had all of the country star allocations. Uh, again, that was made public, so um, we can't really redefine this during a replenishment, but I'm happy to uh, sit down with, uh, with uh, Rajender and, and perhaps go over that a bit more. Um, Annette, in terms of, uh, of, of the private sector, uh, there's going to be a lot more information that will be published in the scorecard, which uh, I don't want to presume the, dis the decision of council on the work program, but should it be approved, the scorecard will be published uh, later today, and that will be available so you can get all the breakdown of the different types. Just to give you an idea, investment mobilized, we, uh, in Jeff 7, we define this as a subset of the co-financing um, to really represent what I call cash in hand, or real cash added value to, uh, to the Jeff project. Um, and this separates kind of, you know, the equally important but very different in-kind contributions that agencies or government, or Jeff agencies or government agencies or other stakeholders bring to the table in terms of staff and so forth. Um, so investment mobilized is not private sector per se, but it does give a good indication of how much additional true resource, financial resources are brought to, to the project. Um, again, there have been a couple of comments on uh, the agency shares. Uh, we, again, uh, refer back to uh, the fact that uh, we are working with uh, with a country-driven model. Um, we have uh, some tools to, uh, to work on this, but uh, we are not, the Jeff Secretariat's not in a position to refuse or reject the project from a country uh, solely based on the agency selection. So it is something that, uh, that perhaps, and, and as we uh, discuss the eventual DBFF uh, uh, streamlining and process of uh, if this is also an issue, perhaps it is for a deeper discussion in terms of additional tools that would allow the Jeff Secretary, the Jeff Partnership, to manage that in a more effective way. But we do hear you. Uh, I thought I would get away with the 10% SGP. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, not a game of mirrors, but uh, uh, without that, uh, UNDP share would be 25% in this work program. Um, interestingly, and we had, dis we had mentioned this during the Jeff 8 replenishment, if you look at the agency distribution in all of the IPs that are submitted in this work program, UNDP is down to 24%. And so contrary to the uh, popular belief that IPs tend to add to concentration, in fact, they do the contrary. And um, the fact that, we've select that uh, we were proposing to select FAO and a, ser a series of co-lead agencies, uh, again, is an indication of that. Uh, Stephanie, again, some comments on, on agency selection or agency distribution. On chemicals and waste, again, these are, uh, I wouldn't say artifacts, but chemicals and waste in international waters usually are the two focal areas that lag a little bit behind uh, star allocation programming. Um, and the reasons are uh, uh, in part because countries really want to get their, you know, their national projects with star money out uh, fast. And also uh, chemicals and waste and more so international waters are a little bit more complex and require 
uh, a lot more discussion uh, w between the secretary and the agencies because in one case or in some cases in chemicals and waste, we're also talking about uh, several countries uh, in a particular project, but we're also uh, talking about making sure that we are using those scarce resources in the best way possible. So we always have a demand that's much greater than what we can fund, uh, and we want to make sure that the pipeline of these projects is really focused on the most important investments in both of those focal areas. So they will catch up. I can assure you that, that uh, we, will, uh, we will quickly catch up. Um, in terms of the support to IPs and limiting uh, the number of IPs per country, um, we never received any uh, guidance from Council on, on that particular uh, aspect. Uh, therefore, we felt that, uh, that you know, countries that submitted uh, expressions of interest that were technically sound, that fit the vision of each of the IPs, and for which we had resources, that they, in fact, should be eligible. Um, uh, I think uh, we do still have, I'm not sure what the number is, we do have a, a, sig a significant amount of resources to be programmed in the IPs. We have three that are coming up in, uh, in, in December, and we have the, the two others uh, that hopefully will also come up. Um, so there is, uh, again, uh, opportunities for countries who perhaps have not been successful or have not been uh, able to, uh, to get into some of the IPs to, uh, to be able to participate. Um, in terms of the midterm review, um, I guess we take that into consideration. We can certainly talk to the IEO. We, we will have the data. It's easy for us to produce uh, the information. Uh, we can certainly have our recommendations, but I don't presume to, uh, to draw up the agenda of the IEO and their office, and uh, they can answer those questions. Um, in terms of results, uh, you know, results and <laughs> the, the estimation of results is, is uh, it's an evolving science within the GEF. Uh, if you recall, we, we started this in GEF 6 and GEF 7. Um, in GEF 7, we were able to build on results from GEF 6 and, and be a little bit more accurate. Uh, in GEF 8, we were able to build even more on, on uh, some results. Um, and believe me, we do spend a lot of time with between the technical staff and the results team in um, looking at the information that we have uh, in the previous cycles, trying to estimate where countries will invest their, their resources, uh, and from that derive an impact in terms of the core indicators that we have. Um, you know, we, if you look at the end of GEF 7, I think we surpassed uh, one or two uh, core indicators by a lot. Uh, but we were fairly on mark with, uh, with many of the others at, uh, at the end of, uh, of Jeff 7. Um, so this is a, it's a work in progress, uh, again, without putting us in, uh, in, in um, outside of the, uh, the firing squad here. Um, we, again, estimate as best we can, but then again, we are subject to what countries will submit in terms of projects. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, our analytical tools uh, are, are improving, and we have a great results team, uh, and our technical staff do a, a better and better job at that. Um, and lastly, there was a question of the quality of the concepts for the IPs. Uh, again, I won't speak for staff, but I'm confident that we, uh, that we did uh, make the best decisions. Um, and we have worked with many countries uh, in terms of some of the non-selected concepts that were not fit uh, or did not fit the, the, the program objectives, that those can be turned into standalone projects. Uh, and if countries still want to submit those, we, we will uh, consider them. Um, I think that's it for this round. So I'll hand bo back over to the co-chair. So colleagues, uh, just uh, a few pieces of information. We'll go for another round of five speakers. Uh, Alf, Alibata, Judith, Richard, and Aaron. And then after that, uh, the staff will respond. And then we go for lunch, hopefully 12.45. And then we come back sharp too. And during lunch, I encourage you to do some uh, homework because uh, of the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, there are a few issues that are burning in your hearts, I'm sure. So uh, use the lunch well. So Alf from Norway, Alf Friso. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of uh, the Denmark-Norway constituency, uh, we'd like to congratulate the Jeff Secretariat for a historically large work program. 
We were very impressed that you were able to prepare such a work program for the council, especially given the additional work brought on by the decisions taken at COP15 on the establishment of the GBF fund. At the same time, we note that five IPs were not included. Were not included. Hello? Were not included in this work program due to resource limitations. So uh, if you could please elaborate on these limitations and if these are financial limitations or staff limitations. And if this is uh, staff limitations, if you could explain how this would fit into the restructuring uh, of the GEF um, and how they would resolve its research limitations in the future. Um, it would also be good to know when the Secretariat expects all 11 IPs to be fully subscribed. In addition, we would like to understand whether the six IPs presented in this work program uh, are now fully subscribed. Uh, we are very pleased to read that the IPs will contribute to the goals and targets of the GBF. And uh, we question how will the IPs uh, implemented in recipient countries be reflected in the updated NB SAPs. We also very much welcome the child projects selected in the ecosystem restoration IP with substantial participation of LVCs across three regions, and we hope to see a similar pattern for the remaining five IPs. Uh, we note that the four NGIs in this work program are all in the Latin American and Asia region, including one in a non-ODA eligible country. And so we wonder how the blended finance program uh, will lead to NGIs in Africa in the future, and is if this is something you're actively working on to achieve. Uh, we can endorse the selection of the lead agency for the Clean and Healthy Ocean IP and look forward to seeing a fruitful co-lead arrangement between the FAO and the different regional MDBs. If this model is successful, we look forward to seeing more of such collaboration between a UN agency and MDBs, IFIs across projects and programs in the future. We have a few specific comments on, on projects in the work program. Uh, firstly, regarding the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes Program Phase 3. This program ticks all the relevant boxes in its results frame uh, with regard to desired outcomes. But regarding the Peruvian part of this project, we note that the document does not reflect last year's and the still ongoing proposed law changes in the Peruvian Congress, which represents a serious concern in terms of the continued work to reduce the deforestation in Peru and indigenous people's rights in our view, this is something that needs to be addressed by the project, and these matters should be considered introduced in the program risk matrix. Um, as the drivers for deforestation vary significantly between countries, we would also suggest, suggest that the program takes a closer look at the drivers in the respective countries in order to properly deploy activities that clearly fit the individual countries' prioritized areas with regard to, to combating deforestation. And then regarding uh, the Circular Solutions to Plastic Pollution Integrated Program, uh, we, support, oops, we support this program as it is, there is a strong need for circular solutions to address plastic waste and single-use plastics from the food and beverage industry. We would strongly encourage the program to build on recent and ongoing efforts to collect knowledge and lessons learned on Extended Producer Responsibility, EPR, in low- and middle-income countries and to actively work to for inclusive and just EPR systems. One project to draw on is the Fair Circularity Initiative developed by Tier Fund and companies such as Nestle, Unilever, Coca-Cola, and PepsiCo. And finally, uh, regarding the plastic reduction in the oceans, sustaining and enhancing actions on sea-based sources, uh, we very much welcome this program on sea-based sources to, uh, regarding marine plastic litter. It builds on the Glow Litter Partner Project, where Norway has been a main donor. We particularly welcome the project components on pilot projects and project demonstrations, as well as finance mobilization towards waste management in selected ports. As the project builds on Glow Litter, we would have liked to have seen more information on how proceeds will support the implementation of the national action plans developed through Glow Litter, including for Costa Rica and Kenya. We will be sending a few more additional comments in writing follow the council meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alf. Alimata de la Cote d'Ivoire, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Président. Je voudrais m'exprimer en français. 
Euh, je parle au nom de notre administrateur qui est en retard et l'arrive de l'aéroport. Je parle également au nom des pays membres de notre circonscription, les pays côtiers de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, pour remercier sincèrement le secrétariat du FEM pour cet ambitieux programme de travail contenant des portefeuilles de projets et programmes de plusieurs pays de notre région. Et ces projets et programmes vont engendrer beaucoup de bénéfices euh, environnementaux à l'égard de la biodiversité de notre région. 1397 milliards de dollars, c'est vraiment du jamais vu dans l'histoire du FEM. Et nous félicitons toute l'équipe du secrétariat pour cette grande ouverture. Euh, nous notons des efforts significatifs qui ont été faits à l'égard de l'Afrique. Bien que nous ne soyons pas tête de liste, il faut encourager l'Afrique quand même pour ses résultats. Concernant les programmes non grant instruments qui sont très attractifs pour le secteur privé, euh, certains de nos pays, des pays de notre région, restent encore traversés des barrières pour le choix des agences d'exécution et bénéficier de ces ressources. C'est le cas de la Côte d'Ivoire. À l'époque, Fée Fonseca avait promis de nous aider, mais hélas, il est parti très tôt, paix à son âme. Nous souhaitons toujours l'aide du secrétariat du FEM, car nos différents ministères sont toujours interpellés par les représentants du secteur privé pour ces guichets du FEM. Pour ma propre gouverne, je voudrais connaître la différence entre les îles vertes et les îles bleues. Pour terminer, nous supportons ce programme ambitieux. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Ali Mata. Uh, Judith, from Uruguay. Eh, buenas, buenos días. Eh, me sumo a los saludos de, de todos eh, a Brasil por acogernos en esta ciudad tan hermosa para hacer este consejo. También eh, nuestra circunscripción saluda y felicita al nuevo co-chair, Tom Bui. Le deseamos lo mejor en su nuevo rol. Nuestra circunscripción celebra también que el programa de trabajo es el más ambicioso de la historia del CHEF por el monto de recursos solicitados para implementar proyectos y que América Latina en esta oportunidad representa a la región con más iniciativas presentadas para la aprobación en este consejo. En el caso del programa de pequeñas donaciones, cuatro de los cinco países de nuestra circunscripción del Cono Sur endosaron esta iniciativa junto con aportes de sus asignaciones STAR, aunque esto no es un requisito obligatorio para formar parte del primer tramo de la financiación del programa. Agradecemos que en un futuro haya más países incluidos en el mismo y que se continúe con una estrecha coordinación entre países y agencias. Al respecto de los proyectos de, sobre non-grant instruments, queremos reiterar la importancia de que las agencias comuniquen a los gobiernos sobre las actividades del sector privado en los países receptores del GEF, tal como está explicitado en la estrategia del sector privado. La importancia de esto radica en que los gobiernos, y especialmente los puntos focales, conozcan y sean informados de este tipo de proyectos con antelación para que las propuestas se encuentren en línea con los intereses de los países. El hecho de no requerir el endoso de los puntos focales no configuraría un problema siempre y cuando exista un mecanismo de comunicación efectiva y conocimiento por parte de los puntos focales y los, y los gobiernos de estos proyectos en esta ventana. A modo de cierre, queremos celebrar la finalización del proceso de selección para el programa de impacto sobre océanos limpios y saludables. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Now it's Richard from Australia. Um, thank you, um, uh, co-chair, chair, uh, Jeff Secretariat, 
Uh, thank you also for the government of Brazil uh, and for the presentations this morning, and also for the people of Brazil to allowing us to be on um, their land and having this meeting. Um, I'd just like to express on behalf of the constituency uh, of Australia, New Zealand and Republic of uh, Korea um, our appreciation for the work program. It is uh, groundbreaking, uh, both in terms of its size but also in the co-financing, uh, and I think that's remarkable. Uh, we are, uh, the constituency is pleased to see the representation of SIDS and LCD LDCs in the program uh, being well represented and we think that's uh, an important principle in reflecting the um, uh, support to those countries of in greatest needs um, to address their um, environmental challenges. Uh, but also it flows on to support to indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, it's already been mentioned, but I think it's again noteworthy, uh, the uh, support that's been provided under the work program to gender. Um, and I think it's important to provide that ongoing support of uh, representation and uh, in, uh, in addressing uh, ongoing gender issues. Um, we recognise that several pro projects contained within the work program aim to provide support to Indigenous peoples. Um, and uh, uh, we, we see that it's important to maintain and possibly increase this focus in the future, uh, recognising the cultural values of Indigenous people, including those of uh, the Pacific. Um, I note from the presentation there is a, a, a very good coverage uh, in the Work Pro Integrated Program of the range of targets uh, and goals under the Global Biodiversity Fro Pro, um, Framework. Uh, we do note there are a, free, a few targets that are missing, in particular uh, one that's important to us is target six, uh, invasive alien species. And I know that there's going to be um, a revised set of projects coming forward in December. I just wanted to note the importance of uh, uh, covering those remaining targets if possible, particularly target six. Um, it has been uh, mentioned already, the concentration issue, and thank you very much for the responses on that. Um, one extra dimension I'd want to raise is uh, it's not just the uh, concentration with UNDP that's already been discussed, but if you look at the top three agencies, it constitutes nearly 70% of the, the work program. Uh, uh, so I think that's also something to look at. Um, it's good to see there's other uh, agencies covered by the, the work program, but the, the top three is a very large amount, as well as um, uh, the, the question of UNDP. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So Aaron's the last speaker for this morning or afternoon, Aaron. After that, Claude and uh, maybe the CEO and then we break for lunch. Thanks. Thank you, co-chair, and uh, thank you also to the government of Brazil for hosting us in this beautiful country. Canada welcomes the Jeff's largest ever work program with 27% of all Jeff 8 resources programmed into 45 programs and projects. We are encouraged to see such a strong work pro program and interest in projects this early in the replenishment cycle. We support efforts made for the work program to cover a large range of focal areas and geographic regions while also benefiting almost all LDCs and SIDS. We feel that the work program represents a good thematic and geographic balance, and we're confident that it will help us to be able to, to lead us to make significant progress in fulfilling the mandate um, for the many conventions we support. In particular, we are pleased to see the work program advances the goals and targets of the KMGBF. Overall, we are supportive of the projects in the work program. However, like France, we also note that projects supporting chemicals and waste are somewhat minimal and would like to see that increased um, going forward. Um, we would also like to encourage further consideration of increased resources to support the Secretariat's capacity to integrate a gender transformative approach across its policy and the programs. Um, like Germany noted, there is much work, good work being done, but. However, we feel um, there is always room to strengthen gender mainstreaming. Um, we would also like to encourage the Jeff Secretariat to maximize meaningful opportunities for Indigenous and local peoples to engage in the project planning process. Um, proposed projects should have an engagement consultation strategy with local and Indigenous peoples, and each development strategy should include um, input from Indigenous peoples. 
Um, finally, we are encouraged by the integrated programs. They present a significant opportunity to generate multiple global benefit across GEF focal areas and really highlight the advantage of uh, the GEF in taking a synergistic approach to tackling the triple crises of climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. We had similar questions about the IPs as, as our colleague from the Swiss, um, Switzerland. Um, and thank you to the Jeff Secretary for responding to those. But I would, I guess, would like to end by also highlighting the importance of data and monitoring and evaluation of those programs going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And from Canada, Claude, you're all set. Thank you very much again to everybody. There are um, several questions, I guess, that uh, I've already answered, but there, uh, there are several new ones um, in terms of. Uh, uh, the question from Norway, Alf. <coughs> the, the composition of the work program uh, is uh, a prerogative of the CEO based on uh, several factors, primarily resource availability, <coughs> despite the fact that we have $5.33 billion uh, in the replenishment, the trustee only allows us to program as much as we have in cash in the trust fund a month before uh, posting the work program. Um, I would have thought $1.4 billion would be enough to flush everything from the system. Uh, I guess we had done such a great job in, uh, in putting the, the IPs together that uh, there were not enough resources. Uh, we had to make a decision to fund all of the IPs and leave a whole bunch of standalone projects from countries aside. Um, we decided that there was a better strategy to make sure that we included all of the standalone country projects, the uh, enabling activities, and then what was left, we made a decision to include uh, five of the, uh, uh, of the eight uh, PFDs or IPs that were ready. Um, again, we tried to <coughs> look at uh, aspects of uh, timeliness. Uh, some of these IPs are building on previous phases. In many cases, it, it wasn't time sensitive in terms of resources. In other cases, we wanted to start new IPs, which take a year, year and a half to kind of get underway. And then also looking at the the, the, the kind of uh, topics and uh, focal areas and issues that were advanced, we felt that the five that were included, um, uh, I'm sorry, six that were included, uh, would bet best represent the uh, issues that were important now uh, as opposed to in a year, year and a half. Uh, these are not easy decisions, but I think in this case, um, our concern was first and foremost to fund all of the standalone projects, which uh, were uh, obviously uh, country driven and that, that allowed us to still have 900 million to, uh, to fund. Um, the, as I said, the uh, <coughs> three that are ready, the three other IPs uh, will be submitted in December, uh, assuming that we have the resources for that. And we hope to have the last two IPs subscribed through the same process that we will start pretty much next week. Uh, to get expressions of interest and start to make selection and uh, build integrated programs that would be ready for December, again, assuming there are enough resources given everything else that will come in. Um, in terms of uh, NGI, um, we, again, uh, work with uh, a call for, uh, for proposals in this case. Uh, in this cycle, in this uh, June NGI cycle, we had six concepts submitted. Um, and we were able to uh, screen four that were ready for uh, inclusion. We have two others that, uh, that we're working with uh, EBRD uh, on, um, on developing, uh, I'm sorry, with DBSA on developing uh, much more. Um, in GEF 7, we had a fairly equitable distribution across regions of NGI project. In fact, Africa had 22% of, uh, of the NGI resources. So again, given time, we usually uh, are able, and geographic distribution and agency distribution uh, are always factors that we try and make sure that, uh, that we're uh, uh, maximizing. We, again, are proactive. Uh, so between the call for proposals, we do reach out to countries and agencies, and that's something that the staff uh, are doing uh, uh, as we speak. Um, Uh, sorry, I was going to, I had something else in the, oh, uh, the engagement with countries. Um, we do that uh, according to the established uh, process. 
if there are examples where countries feel we have not communicated, please let us know because we have communicated and we keep countries uh, engaged uh, through uh, through the agencies. So hopefully that um, that will improve, if not uh, uh, is already uh, well underway. Um, Again, not much, uh, uh, and thanks for all of the congratulations uh, on, on the work that we've done. Uh, believe me, my staff uh, will be very relieved uh, at some point today when the decision is made by the work by the council on the work program. They've worked uh, very, very hard. Um, the agency concentration again uh, is uh, is uh, shown in uh, in the cover note. Um, I, uh, I'm encouraged a little bit by uh, some of the uh, agencies that came in in the last accreditation, namely uh, CI and IUCN, which as I mentioned, <coughs> in real dollars and almost in percentage, they already have as much as they had in the entire GEF 7 cycle. Um, so I think, uh, you know, th this is not obviously a, something, a curve that we can correct uh, very quickly because of the, the parameters that I've already mentioned. But I think there are agencies, namely those two, that are really starting to understand and add value to countries and bringing in a lot more projects. Time will tell, but um, hopefully if they continue to grow, uh, you know, those shares may turn into 8, 9, and 10 percent, uh, and that may, uh, may flatten the curve a little bit more. Um, I'm going to ask Mohammed to talk about uh, Alf's comments on the critical forest biome because I think that's, uh, there were some interesting comments or questions there that we'd like to answer. Um, yeah, there was a question. Uh, I think it was it was really just a, a, um, a, a comment, but a very important one regarding ch law changes in Peru um, and the need to accommodate um, specific considerations to drivers in each country. Uh, indeed, we are aware of the the changes, um, and uh, and these are these are going to be priorities during the design of the individual child project because uh, the PFD just provides a framework and then now we have to go to each of the countries and engage them in designing projects that will conform to that framework and indeed uh, the, the the changes in Peru are, are ones that we've noted uh, uh, already and uh, in each country will be also then focusing specifically on the drivers that are unique to its context and, uh, and then we can then look at how that relates across the whole biome so that we have a, a, a more constructive approach at the regional level with each of the countries playing their own part. But the child projects are meant to respond specifically to the country's own context. So that's why we need to go into that design phase now after the work program is approved. Thank you. Uh, let me just go back to one last question on the invasive uh, alien species uh, uh, question by Richard. Uh, the Blue Green Island IP will address this in part. Uh, certain countries will probably build capacity and, and incorporate some of that uh, management uh, into uh, into their child projects. But historically, this is uh, this is a, a, an investment area that has always been part of the Jeff programming directions in the last several cycles, and it has very little. Uh, uptake from countries for whatever reason. Uh, ecologically, uh, it, it's extremely important. Um, uh, you know, if you live in a in, in an isolated country, a uh, small country, uh, it, it is very, very important. From an ecological point of view, we all know uh, that this also is, could be devastating uh, in terms of uh, displacement of species and uh, and creating havoc on uh, on different ecosystems. But for whatever reason, it, it remains a, a low uptake. We have several issues like this that remain fairly low, of low interest to countries. And again, we cannot force uh, the, unless we were to develop an IP on invasive species, uh, which may incite countries to participate, uh, we are still at the, at the mercy of countries uh, adopting this. Thank you. So thank you, Claude and Mohammed. Now it's lunchtime. Uh, please remember, be back here at two because we have a lot of speakers. And uh, this is a historic, meaningful program. Lunch is downstairs, two floors. And uh, please feel free to uh, make it a working lunch because we will begin the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund discussions this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>